little bit right now and figuring last things out before the actual conference starts in half an hour or 29 minutes actually all right i'm oh, why did you stop a bit right now figuring last things out before the actual conference starts in half an hour oh Yanshi, um we can hear you twice right now or something like that no no I, the, the youtube just worked okay just yeah. moving. All right, so we're we're live on YouTube now as well. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, but let's see. No. Ah. Okay. Then, Fabrizio, do you quickly want to try sharing your screen? Yes, let me let me try. I want to do share. Nice. Is it good? Does it work? Yes, excellent. I always have to remember to re-enable my mic because every time you share here in the browser. Okay, but I think it's good. Okay, and then do we maybe want to have uh, someone who always... Oh, no, I'll, I'll put up the sponsor slide and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> No, no. Uh, can can someone else put up the the sponsor slide? Does someone have multiple screens who can do that? I can do it actually. Okay, then you'll do it. But uh, do not forget to put it off. Right, uh, you really need to be um, uh, available for for me uh, to to put it off so other people can screen share because currently it is not possible to screen share while someone else is screen sharing. Yeah. Stefan, raise hands. Uh, ah, is, is Stefan Gunnerman already here? I don't think so from the spelling. Uh, okay. Like a lot to talk. Yeah, well, then you, you can just uh, ignore it. And uh, Stefan has a question. He can also post it in the, uh, in the, in the Q&A, I guess. Yeah, and... Um, Chaitanya, do you maybe also want to monitor the chat and write some of the questions into the keynote discussions channel, for example? Thank I guess you. that's something we can all do. Uh, yeah. is, the, is the Zoom link already on the website? Yes, it should be just loading. I just pushed, so it should be there soon. Nice. Uh, that's the classic uh, GitHub pages loading. Yes. Uh, but Julia is here. Um, there now. Okay. And if anyone, uh, Yanchi, Julia is here. Maybe you can make her a panel. Yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm. I just made. I'm trying to share my screen. Hey. Thank you. Hi, Julia. Hello. Hello. What if I just use this? Uh, by the way, Julia, we are live on YouTube already, and we have 140 people listening. <laughs> I know, I know. I've been on YouTube before joining the Zoom. <laughs> Don't worry. So, uh, yeah, everyone, um, uh, let me just uh, repeat again. Uh, the conference is starting in 25 minutes. We're just finishing up last things here. You're happy, to, uh, welcome to stay and to watch us organize our last stuff and get the, the last things fixed. Uh, Fox, if it's okay for you, I'll get back in 25 minutes just for a quick rehearsal and yeah, um, yeah I'll be awesome. back. Um, are you leaving the Zoom and should we I make you panelist again? I can stay here. I just mute myself. I think it should be fine. Okay. Excellent. Great.
Andrea? Yep. Have you um, have you coordinated with the the oral speakers? Uh, no. Uh, okay, I'm not sure it was me. Maybe Julia. I can oh check. yeah. I'm sorry. I meant Julia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. I have received some replies from the authors of the orals. Uh, definitely the one from today. <laughs> so we are all good. Okay, so we are all set for the orals today. And uh, uh, do you want to introduce them? Uh, yes. Sure. Or yeah. Good. I'm okay introducing them. Perfect. And then yeah, I mean, let's let's see if the screen sharing. Uh, works out with them i i'm sure it will be fine yes and we yeah, won't have an oral with two presenters that will be trickier but <laughs> let's hope that the zoom will help us i mean uh we we all know how the zooms work and uh, yeah we can uh, we'll make it work as good as possible uh then yeah hi everyone we're starting in seven minutes we're very excited Does someone maybe quickly uh, want to share in the in the what's it called in my reading group Slack that we're starting the stuff and things with that channel? In... Sorry, could you repeat? I send the message from oh. All right, everyone, five minutes to go.
it, yeah oh can you just Hannes, maybe good to switch to the opening slides. Two minutes to go. Yes, definitely. Let me do that. Uh, done. Uh -huh. no, here we have the slides. All right, we have hit the mark, uh, but I will just give it a second more before we start. Ah, this is exciting. Good, everyone. I think we can start. Yes, the obligatory one minute delay is completed. And let's get to the first Learning on Graphs conference. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm super happy. Let us start with the, the first ever Learning on Graphs conference happening and right now. So before we get uh, to our first keynote, to our first real content here in 30 minutes by Stefan Müllmann, let me quickly explain how you will get the, the most out of this online conference, uh, show you some statistics, and we will also announce the review awards. So let's get to that. Yeah, first of all, how, how to get the most of the conference? How does the online stuff work? Well, we have our Slack channel. Please join the Slack. There we will announce everything. If you don't want to miss what's going on, uh, if you're in the Slack, then you're all set. And there you, you'll find everything. Of course, the schedule, it, it is also on the Slack. as some images. But on the website, you find that information next to a lot of other information. Uh, so, so check it out. And check out those headers up there. Yeah, and then uh, everything that we do, all the conference will be happening in this very Zoom room, uh, except for the tutorials where we have three other Zoom rooms. But uh, of course, we will announce all of that on Slack. Go to our Slack. Uh, and this whole stuff is also live streamed on YouTube. And the, the poster sessions and the socials, like uh, today we have an awesome, awesome poster session that I'm really looking forward, uh, where I really want to talk to you. And the, the socials as well, like tomorrow uh, at the end or on, on Sunday at the end, uh, they will be happening via Gathertown. Like there you can walk around with your little avatar, talk to people and discuss the awesome posters and also like meet famous professors and, and chat, with, uh, chat with them. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, very quickly, right? what I mean is here, this website, uh, there you find a bunch of information. Here's the, the Slack link, also the Zoom link, which you probably already found. Yeah, uh, join join the Slack here, uh, which you find on the Log Conference website. And here you, you also have the schedule that, that will always stay up to date. All right. So I think I, I stressed enough to, to join the Slack. 
Uh, well, I will say it again for, for people that join a little late, uh, later on as well. But then, why the learning of graphs conference? Why do we need this additional conference and what do we want to achieve? So the field of learning on graphs and geometry has grown pretty large, of course. And from conferences, we know that having these workshops where all the people work on the same topics that you're interested in as well, like at these workshops, you can really have some of the most amazing discussions and conversations. So uh, these are great, but having another learning on graphs uh, workshop or something like that would maybe be not so fit because the field is just so large so uh, well uh, we have a conference where we now can uh, advance the latest research and uh, yeah, have the, the best research in graph and geometric machine learning here and that is of course one of the largest reasons for having this additional conference but also what we want to do is to really have a conference that is accessible to everyone and free to attend and virtual and yeah, we really pay a lot of attention to being inclusive. We give our best to um, yeah, have this be truly accessible to everyone all around the world. And of course, uh, the time zone um, differences make it uh, very difficult as well. But uh, we try to address everything that we can and uh, we're happy to take any uh, additional feedback, please. Uh, just let us know about your opinions, right? Uh, this is a very community-driven um, endeavor, and yeah, we want to uh, pay attention to all the feedback that we get, and we're trying to do our best here right now, and we also want to improve every single year. So your feedback is taken into account a lot. But then one of the large things of this conference and one of the, the big things we want to change is the reviews and uh, the review quality. So while, of course, there, there are these large uh, conferences already, we know that uh, they have issues with the, with the reviews. And we also still have many issues with reviews and review quality. Uh, but we, we aim to improve this. And these large conferences, right, um, it would be extremely risky for them to experiment and innovate and uh, try to do some new stuff and yeah maybe also some some of the new stuff just doesn't work at this scale yet and you have to implement it in a step-by-step -step way so we have this young super new conference here where we can take these risks and where we really want to try to innovate to experiment to change the review process and then hopefully later on maybe these um, techniques become more established. We see that stuff works, our ideas work, and then the bigger conferences might be able to adopt them, these ideas as well. So we hope to, yeah, as, uh, in that way, we hope to improve the review quality here in the Learning on Grass conference, but also the review quality in the machine learning research community. Yeah, and we have multiple ways to do that, of course. And uh, where we, for example, have reviewers for the reviewers that will then review the papers. So uh, we don't just let everyone review here. Uh, we really pay a lot of attention who, to who our reviewers are. And of course, we have our monetary rewards for the reviewers of $1,500 uh, for the top 20 reviewers. And later on, I will get to how we select these top 20 reviewers. And, um, I will announce the winners, of which most don't already know who uh, that they won this prize even. But yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. But for now, I'm really excited to share with you some statistics here. So let's get to that. We all love statistics. All right. Thanks, Hannes. So here's Yuanqi. Yeah, welcome everyone to this newborn conference, Learning on Graphs. When we started, uh, we did, at the very beginning, we didn't expect this to, this initiative to be so successful. Now I would like to share you some statistics and evidence why I said it's successful. So first of all, we have received uh, around 3,000 registrations, and this demonstrates how vibrant our Learning on Graphs conference uh, community is. We have received, received a total of 266 submissions in which we accepted 71 poster presentations and the 12 oral presentations. We also have recruited 372 reviewers and 46 area chairs. 
in which we select uh, 20 reviewer awards um, and three AC awards. For reviewer awards, it will be with high, highly monetary price, which will be announced in a moment. And uh, we will also have six local meetups around the world with the extensive efforts from the local organizers. And we are very proud of that part. So for some detailed statistics, um, you know, for abstract track, we have an acceptance rate of 38%. And for full paper track, we have an acceptance rate around 30%. Um, next, let's look at the keywords in our conference submissions. So here's the word count. So uh, clearly you can see, and uh, as expected, graph and network, graph being the most frequent word and network being the second, but you can also identify some trend from this word cloud. This has, by the way, this has been printed from the keyword appearing in the title of all the submitted papers. So for example, the explanation, benchmark, efficiency, dynamic, or yeah, many things that are very trendy in the community has exhibited here. So next I'm gonna talk about the geographical author distribution where we have attracted submissions from all over the world across 38 countries or regions. And here are some interesting facts about authorship. Each paper had four, around four authors on average. And uh, the most collaborative paper had 15 authors. And um, there were five papers had only one single author. And here's are the detailed statistics uh, across countries and regions. With re regard to review quality, which this is something we emphasize again and again, and we want to test. We have most of the reviewers submit the review on time, and here are the statistics about the length of reviews. Um, we would say this is already a great success with a great pool of reviewers. All submissions receive at least three reviews. Um, on average, the review length was four, around 450 words, and the most lengthy review contained 2,000 words. Um, but still, notice the orange part. We still have a long way to improve the review quality, but we already have a good starting point. Uh, one thing I do want to note here, even though we just printed it out this review lens, uh, this is not the, or never gonna be the only factor we are gonna uh, evaluate the reviewers and the review quality. Hence, we'll introduce the process in detail later, but we do not only count the words. Uh, next, we have set up a list of uh, appealing programs, I hope, to everyone, including five keynote talks, eight tutorials, 12 oral presentations, three reviewer sharing, and uh, two poster sessions and two social hours. Um, you can, yeah, I just already mentioned our schedule is everywhere. It's here on our website, our Slack channel, and everywhere. Um, then uh, I want to introduce our team. Uh, first, I'm very honored here to introduce our two program chairs. By the way, both of them are, are around. Um, thanks for the exceptional contribution and all this time they have put into our conference and make this conference so successful. They are Professor Bastian Rick from Amhos Munich and Dr. Razvan Pazkino from DeepMind. They have been a great examples for the whole community and uh, for everyone of us. And then we also have a list of uh, reputable researchers um, as our advisors in our community. Um, I, I, I'm sure probably, I think everyone is familiar with at least some of them or most of them. So I won't, due to the time constraint, I won't list them their name here, but you can check, they're everywhere. They're on our website. And uh, we are truly thankful for their help, suggestions and the guidance along the way to make this conference, this community event so successful. And uh, at last, before I hand over to Chantanya, um, I want to introduce our organizing team, a group of young, passionate researchers and community, community builders I've ever met uh, who devoted countless time into the organization of the conference. You, you can imagine how hard it is to organize a conference. And uh, I'm very proud to team up with everyone of them. And uh, I'm so happy, yeah we made this happen. And uh, yeah, again, due to the time concern, I won't list everyone's name here, but you can find everyone on our website and everyone around, everyone during the social hours or poster sessions. If you catch any of them, feel free to talk to them if you want. And yeah, provide any feedback if you have any. Um, then I'll hand over to 
uh, Chitania to introduce our local meetups. In addition to the organizers, we feel very happy that LOG is a global distributed network with six total local meetups, which are happening in person simultaneously with this virtual conference. You can find out about their schedules independently via our Slack. We have meetups in Cambridge, UK, Boston and the Bay Area in the US, Montreal, Canada, Paris, France, and Wurzburg in Germany, as well as Omicron per se. Uh, all our meetups are free to attend with the main goal of bringing together the local graph and geometric ML community and really providing a platform for local students and researchers to connect with each other. So thank you very much to the local meetup organizers as well for this initiative and for their leadership. And finally, um, now getting a completely new conference up and running would be impossible without the generous support of the following organizations and companies. Our gold sponsors, Pfizer and Genentech, our silver sponsors, Amazon Science and Neo4j, and our bronze sponsors, Google, DeepMind, Kumo, and PyTorch Geometric. Thank you very much to all of our sponsors who have covered the cost of Zoom, GatherTown, as well as most importantly, our experiment in monetary rewards for our reviewers. And I'll hand it over to Hannes to talk about that. Yes, and I really want to stress how important this is to us. Like, we cannot understate how important the, the sponsorship monies are that we're getting from these companies because these reviewer awards, while there are only one of the aspects that we implement uh, to hopefully make review quality better next to stuff like our reviewer reviews or like also just communicating a lot more and a lot more openly with our reviewers, I think, than some other conferences. Uh, these reviewer rewards and these awards, uh, of which we have 20 with uh, $1,500, uh, I think they're really a large part of making these reviews better, a large part of advancing, like really concretely improving research. And yeah, this is, I think, a very good use of uh, the sponsor money. And um, I think all of these companies can be very proud of uh, supporting the research community in, in this way. Yeah. And maybe we can already see some, some evidence for the review quality being uh, improved. Of course, here we just have anecdotes and we picked out some screenshots here of people um, being very happy with the review quality of the Learning on Graphs conference and also uh, it notably being um, the timeliness or the quality, however you could judge the quality being better than in some other conferences. But of course, these other conferences are much, much bigger, right? And they cannot experiment like we do and try out these innovations. This would be very risky uh, for them. And so we really hope that as a young conference here, we can show that some of the concepts here, or you can make these experiments and then show that some of the concepts really work. And then Hopefully, we can work together with these other conferences to uh, for them to maybe adopt some of these ideas, and then uh, we we try to improve the research community as a whole this way. Okay, but then these reviewer rewards definitely are a big part of uh, what's improved the, uh, the the quality. And before we get to to announcing the twenty winners of a thousand five hundred dollars. How do we select them? Well, uh, we let the authors, first of all, in the bottom of this pyramid, you can see our first set. We let the authors and our area chairs score all of the uh, reviewers, uh, all of the reviews. And like from one to five, what is the quality of the review? And there we never ask about something like the, the review length, right? The, the, the amount of words. We don't make the length of the review uh, an a criterion at all. It is not a criterion. It's maybe an interesting statistic, but it's not a criterion for choosing our best reviews. And yeah, uh, we select these scores from the authors and the area chairs, and then we uh, sort all of the reviews, all of the reviews by these scores. And then this is definitely not the last step. We then anonymize 
or the way we did it, we anonymized all of the, the reviews and the texts that they wrote, all of the reviews that they wrote. And then we, we handed this to our two amazing program chairs, which really went through all of them. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure where they take their time from, but our program chairs are really uh, amazing. And what they do for the community is incredible. Um, yeah, they went through all of these selected, um, through all of these reviewers, and then came up with the top 20, which uh, we will now announce uh, very shortly, which won the $1,500. But um, before we do that, also look at the bottom of the pyramid to the left, right? We have the authors and ACs. Of course, while the, the reviewers um, are hugely important for the conference, also, the authors are extremely important for the conference and the area chairs. So we also want to have some uh, announce the, the top three uh, area chairs here, maybe. Hage Mama, Peter Vlitschkovic and Ben Chamberlain. And what they've done is just as amazing uh, as what our program chairs have done. Like what time they invested and the, the same can be said for most of the other 45 pro, uh, area chairs that we had. But uh, these three really stood out. And if we have to make a choice, these are the, the three top area chairs that we choose. But well, this year, uh, unfortunately, there's no pr prize money for you guys. But uh, maybe maybe that will change next year. But for where there is prize money is for our top 20 reviewers. Um, none of them, except for two of them, uh, knew that they are the winners of this, this prize money yet. So, yeah, we will let them all know. We will announce this via Twitter as, as well, of course. But, yeah, we will also send them all emails that they've won these $1,500. They have, uh, are the best reviewers at the Learning on Graphs conference. And, yeah, if you uh, maybe want to win $1,500 the next year, then please keep your ears open and apply to us when we have our call for reviews next year. And then one of the, these reviews, he already knew that he won the prize. Uh, well, I think he learned about it two days ago or something like that. But he was so gracious to put together a, a short presentation and uh, to let us know about his philosophy for reviewing and um, yeah, maybe we can learn uh, one or two things from him about reviewing and we can adopt that in our, to our own reviews whenever we need to make them. And that is Fabrizio Frasca. So with that, I would be happy to, to hand over to you if you please uh, share your screen. Yeah. So everyone, uh, I really hope that we can uh, enjoy or, and learn something from this, this presentation and then Fabrizio, what are your insights into reviewing? What is your philosophy? Hi, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me and you can uh, see my presentation. Uh, yeah, let me share a few thoughts. Um, uh, first of all, I'm delighted to, to know I'm one of the selected awardee and uh, it's been a really a pleasure to review for blog uh, this year. So for sure, I, I must say it's been engaging and fun. I think this is because of two main reasons. Uh, the assigned papers, uh, at least the, the papers that were assigned to me, were really highly targeted. So I could really bid on the my field, specific sp field of expertise, and this helped a lot in sustaining meaningful discussions on open review with other elders and, and, and reviewers. Um, and in this sense, I must also be grateful to the area chairs for uh, these assignments, right? On the other hand, I think an important factor that has been played by the low load. Um, so the, the low number of papers assigned to reviewers, I believe it's around two and three. And um, this has really taken away the deadline stress. So it's, it's freed up a lot of space that I could really spend to have fun and engage in, in the conversations and, and really do not compromise on the quality. Um, maybe a few thoughts I want to share. We all know what are the main guidelines to maybe, uh, you know, for a successful review. And also the, uh, the log uh, committee has shared these guidelines on the website. It's been very useful. I just wanted to add something more. I think uh, what I believe is important to keep a focus on the structure of the of the review and um, in particular to consider the target for each of the section of the review. So I would like to, uh, you know, think about it this way. 
we have three parts, three sections in, in the review. The first section is where we provide a recap as reviewers. And this is very important it's to make sure that we are all on the same page, that we are all understood, uh, understood the contributions of the paper. And the target for this section is uh, essentially everybody, is the, the reviewers, uh, the other reviewers, the area chair and the others. So it's important to bear this in mind. The other section, I believe, is about pros and cons and an overall recommendation for acceptance, right? And what I believe is important to bear in mind is that this uh, is targeting specifically the area chair um, in, in particular. And this section has to be written uh, in a way that this is helpful for, for them. And lastly, the, the, the third section, which probably to me is the most engaging and, and fun, is when we uh, ask questions to the authors and um, pro provides ideas for improvements. This is specifically targeting authors. And I believe, again, it's very important to bear this in mind. This can be comprehensive, very lengthy in, in principle, as long as it's structured very well. So I would uh, recommend always using a lot of um, uh, structure in here, maybe uh, organizing uh, ideas for improvements in immediate improvement and uh, further future improvements, and I use a lot of bullets and enumerations, I believe. But in particular for this section, what I, I think is important is to really get into this mindset of getting into the shoes of the authors reading the review. Um, this is something I, I thought I thought and I believe is very helpful. So what would be the reaction of the authors reading my my review and my the section of the review? Would they be feel this interesting and would this uh, somehow uh, lead them to investigate additional ideas and the possibility to to go for additional experiments? This is I think an important mindset to to have when reviewing. Um, but at the end of the day, I believe always there's not really a free line for reviewers, right? So. For an alpha review, the process should be thought of. And this means, I believe, that we need to keep iterating this process of reading the paper, digesting the ideas offline, think about them, uh, maybe think about connections with previous works and other ideas we had in the past and keep repeating the cycle over and over. And, uh, and then I think there's always um, about, it's always about really having the, the um, uh, the courage to venture into proofs and details. This is important. They are probably the most important parts of the papers and of the contributions. And most of the time they are relegated to the appendix. And I believe it's really important as reviewers to, to have the responsibility to, to go through them thoroughly. And at the end, engage, engage, and keep engaging with the author, with the other uh, reviewers and the other chair. And of course, this takes time, right? So it's uh, uh, there's no free lunch, but on the other hand, you know, we might have incentive. and. Uh, in this conference, uh, the, the committee has experimented with uh, a mixture, for example, of public uh, award and acknowledgement, such as the one that uh, you know, uh, has just done, and on the other hand, a monetary, monetary compensation. Uh, historically, reviews have been considered voluntary, so I think it's also somehow a good time to keep to you know to start discussing as a community about incentive schemes more in general and i just wanted to share in a few minutes uh, some thoughts i had about this um unsolicited thoughts but yes so first of all i think the most the popular opinion is that as already anas has highlighted the the, the quality of log um is of the, uh, the reviews for log is incredibly high um this is i think um cannot be really disputed um What's uh, so the, I think the elephant in the room at this point is whether the financial reward, uh, the promise for the financial reward really may have played a role or not. Um, there's been some discussion online on Twitter, and interestingly, there's uh, there are other ideas which uh, I, I somehow uh, agree with. That is, it might not just be about the financial reward, it might also be about other factors. For example, one thing is, uh, as we were mentioning, the low load of papers, but at the same time, the specificity, so that the fact that um, reviewers really can uh, go and review um, papers which are um, which pertain uh, particularly to their area area of expertise, and I think this is a luxury we have as uh, you know being this conference also uh, specific to gra learning on graphs, and we should really uh, be uh, happy about this. Um, just uh, some um, uh, thoughts I wanted to share. Uh, and maybe you know, food for thoughts, and we can discuss this even offline. Is is this top K award scheme um, the best we can do? I have the impression that in in the long run it might be also discouraging. So think about the fact that maybe you are ranking your reviewers and you're only awarding the the top uh, chunk of them, say top twenty five percent. If you want to 
um, you know, in principle reward uh, ab above a certain high bar of quality, what can happen is that you might also get lucky and you have a very skillful set of reviewers and all of them will, will meet uh, the, 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 re the requirements you're, you're setting. But at the end of the day, you only um, award the top, um, you know, the top uh, score ranking ones. Um, so what happens in the long run is that the other reviewers might get frustrated and this might be discouraging. I believe we should keep thinking about it and um, um, of course we can adjust the number of ORDs uh, based on the budget. So this introduces another factor, you know, it, it, this all depends on the budget. Uh, it could be interesting to explore hybrid schemes where we, we can think of compensating financially all reviewers but only awarding publicly uh, top scoring ones. And um, a few last thoughts before uh, we start with the, with the first talk. Uh, sponsors might be essential because of course they provide a budget to actually go with financial rewards. Uh, but what if we don't really have enough budget or what if the budget is limited? I think in this case, it's important to make sure that the budget will always cover uh, publication fees, fees for attendance and access. Uh, uh, and in this case, I share Leonardo's thoughts. Um, so when the budget is limited and we are using it for this, then we also need to think a little bit more about potential schemes where we don't have uh, financial financial rewards. I've put here a few ideas. Uh, if the premises is, is that good peer reviews are essential for high quality research and reviews could somehow be con considered as contributions per se, then maybe we can uh, discuss about um, a, a potential um, scheme where we could uh, de-anonymize reviewers maybe after a double blind review, make them publicly uh, considered contributors to a paper perhaps and uh, public their reviews uh, as it is now in open review or even attached as appendix as part of the manuscript because this is part of the contribution itself. It's not a result contribution but it's still important. And I think we could we can discuss start to discuss about this, for example, um, this would maybe increase accountability and knowledge merit. And yeah, let's keep discussing this online. Um, I started already to discuss this with ChatGPT and I think the discussion started to get interesting, but it will be even more interesting to discuss uh, together. Um, and with this, I end the presentation and uh, I end it over to Anis again. Awesome, thank you so much, Fabrizio. Uh, I mean, this is, this is great. This is exactly what we want, right? These discussions. Let's not discuss with chat GPT. Let's discuss uh, with, with each other. Um, really, a lot of the ideas that you mentioned, uh, these we've already thought about and we have to continue thinking about them. And this is exactly what you want. So to everyone else who's attending here, uh, please get in touch with us. Give us your feedback. This is exactly uh, yeah, how we want to proceed. We want to really pay attention to the feedback that we're getting. And whenever we get a message, I'm amazed by um, the, the amount of thought that all of our organizers put into the, the messages. So we, we send them into the Slack and we discuss it and we try to improve. So yeah, please let's work together. Let's try to improve the research community. But uh, enough about uh, about talking about conferences, organizing, and reviews. Let's talk about uh, what we all care the most about, uh, which is research. Uh, maybe research about learning on graphs and geometry. And with that, I want to to start off with our first keynote by Professor Stefan Günnemann from Technical University of Munich where he recently won the, the highest possible prize. And yeah, I can, I can attest to that. I did my master's at, uh, at the same university. And yeah, there at uh, Technical University of Munich, he won the Heinz Meyer Leibniz medal very recently, which is amazing. So uh, I'm, I'm just doubly happy to have Professor Stefan Gündemann here now. Uh, but we, of course, we all know him for his great work in the, in the learning graphs field, where he we know him maybe mostly for his work on robustness, for example, and also his work on uncertainty. But he also has some very good works uh, together with Nicolas Gao, for example, on machine learning, graph machine learning for molecules. So this is uh, what Professor Gunnerman will talk about now. And with that, I would love to hand over to, to him. Let's go. Thanks a lot for the very, very nice introduction. Um, I'm very honored for these words. And I'm actually very honored that I can give the opening keynote at, the, at this new conference. That's, that's really great. And thanks a lot. I hope you can hear me well. 
I don't hear any complaints, so that seems to work excellent. Um, I don't want to destroy the first keynote here. Okay, good. Um, yeah, again, thanks. Thanks a lot for, for these words. Um, yeah, as Hannes said, I will talk about uh, graph neural networks or graph learning specifically for molecules today. And this is like a bit like an introductory talk, I want to say, right? Like to give all of you who have never worked on, for example, uh, molecules, to also give the chance to, to dig into that topic and to see what kind of challenges we are tackling there and to give you a bit of inspiration and uh, what you might want to work on also in the future. And I want to start a bit with the... Uh, motivation. So what, what are we interested in? We're interested here in, in molecular modeling. So what we at the end of the day want is, for example, designing new materials, new drugs, new catalysts to make the world better, of course, right? So this is the big question we try to tackle here. And uh, on, on a more technical side, so to say, the underlying task we are trying to solve is essentially we have some kind of molecule, so like the positions and the atomic numbers, which you all, I guess, learned like in, in high school, right? And we want to somehow predict or compute the underlying properties, for example, energy, forces, or even higher level uh, properties of molecules like toxicity or something like that, which has various applications. Like, for example, you can use it in, for example, predicting binding energies or reactions, or for example, molecular dynamics. So to just give you here an uh, impression, so here's this short video. Let's see whether I can play that now. Yeah, I have to switch that here. So here you see, for example, like, uh, how does it work? Okay, I cannot play the video, but you should see now here, like an animation uh, of this of, of this tiny molecule docking to the surface uh, to a crystal, which essentially is showing like a video of an, uh, a molecular dynamics uh, in a very complicated setting. We have many 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 atoms interacting here, and you see how this small molecule is essentially docking to the surface. Okay, so this is one challenge, for example, we want to solve which essentially, for example, leads to better uh, alloys, which can, for example, imp improve the energy efficiency of specific materials, or if you look at batteries and so on and so forth. More specifically, we are usually not just interested in a property as shown here on the left for a single molecule, and it's, let's say, the energy, but we are often interested in the so-called potential energy surface, which essentially just means we have multiple different geometries, could be different molecules, or could be different arrangements, so to say, of a specific molecule, and then we want to have the energy for all these different configurations. Okay, so this is usually the task we're interested in, not just for a single molecule, of course. So how can we solve this? I mean, classically, of course, we can use simulations, right? There has been decades uh, of research on how to simulate these uh, settings, but the issue is that this is very expensive, right? You have to wait quite some time. So actually the question we are really answering with machine learning is here, how can we efficiently design new materials, drugs, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, in principle, we know how to do this if we have infinite time, but the question is how to do this efficiently. And here is essentially where machine learning plays a role where we hopefully as, as a graph uh, machine learners can contribute a bit. And this then more or less like a bit the overview of the talk. Let's see how much time I have. But I want to show you two different principles, how we can use machine learning to solve this problem of designing new materials or predicting properties of molecules. So two different principles. And if I still have time at the end, I also want to talk a bit about met benchmarking, which is always an issue, of course, in machine learning and specifically also in this domain. So let's start with the first question, though. And let's start with one principle. And as a machine learner, you might already have an idea how we can actually tackle this problem of having this or uh, getting an information about this potential energy surface. We can just treat it as a standard supervised learning problem, right? So we have here the surface, which is like a regression, right? We have some training points, which we have collected by running some simulations. We have a database. Then we train some machine learning model, and then we can do inference to predict, hopefully, for different geometries, different molecules, the underlying energy, let's say, right? So this is a classic supervised a learning setting or regression scenario where machine learning can be used. And this has been done, of course, not just recently, not just uh, in, in our community, but again, also for decades in a very classic setting that we have, for example, here our molecule, we extract some kind of a fingerprint, like a feature extraction, if you want. So, right, then we use some machine learning techniques, let it be some standard ones or more recent neural networks, and then we do a prediction, right? Since we're here at the Learning for Graphs conference, this is, of course, not what we want, right? So we have here a graph as an input, a molecule. We don't want to extract by hand some features and then use, uh, I don't know, like a support vector machine or uh, whatever MLP, right? What we, of course, want, which makes a lot of sense, is let's use a graph neural network. 
right? Because graphs are operating on uh, graphing networks are operating on graphs, right? And molecules can be represented as graphs, as you see here, right? So it's specifically suited for this task because now we can exploit the underlying geometry, underlying structure of molecules by using this GNN principle. I guess I don't have to explain you here how GNNs work, right? That we are exchanging messages between the nuclei, so between the atoms, between the nodes, right? You should all know, I guess, how a graph neural network works, right? So what are the challenges here on a high level? So of course you can first say, I mean, let's take whatever standard a graph neural network. The issue is that this only exploits the structure, so only that we have nodes and edges. This, of course, is not really super helpful for a molecular setting because we're essentially not exploiting that this object is actually living in a three-dimensional space, right? We have additional coordinates, essentially. And just operating on the structure is not powerful enough, right? I mean, of course, we cannot distinguish certain uh, molecules if you don't take into account where the actual position in space is, right? So we want to somehow exploit these 3D coordinates, which we have attached to every atom. And the naive idea would be, let's just use these atom coordinates as additional inputs, as attributes to our nodes, right? This, however, is very, very suboptimal because we would violate very uh, fundamental properties. For example, that we have translation or rotation invariances here with respect to the energy. What it means is like if you rotate your, your, your molecule, right? It, of course, does not change its energy, right? So changing the position, so translating or rotating it, doesn't change underlying properties. It's invariant, for example, to translation or a rotation, right? And this doesn't work if we use 3D coordinates. And this is indeed one fundamental question which uh, has been tackled here in this field of uh, GNNs for, for molecules. So how can we design expressive GNNs? So going beyond only the structure, but at the same time, we want to respect the underlying symmetries so that it's uh, invariant or equivariant with respect to specific properties, which are given by the, by the physics of our underlying system. So how can we do this? How can we uh, get expressivity, which is, of course, a super important topic in GNNs, right? Here, specifically in this physical work. And one first idea for that, which has been exploited a lot, is let's just enrich our graph neural network by pairwise distance information. So we have here positions in space. So we can encode what is the distance between these atoms, and let's use this as additional input to our GNN. Right? This sounds already nice, and many people did this, which already improves a lot the performance compared to classic non-graph uh, molecular machine learning uh, systems. Still, it has a lot of limitations. So the first one was more from a theoretical point of view that we still cannot distinguish certain graphs, even in a fully connected setting. Meaning, even if we have here connected every node and we have the pairwise distances, we cannot distinguish certain molecules, right? And we are not um, powerful enough, so to say, to do this, which is a quite a surprising result. And the second is, is that we don't really use the knowledge which we have gathered in this field for, for already for years. So for example, what is a well-known fact is in this, uh, it's called force field in this community. We know that the main parts which contribute to the energy is not only the bond energy, so like the pairwise energy, so to say, but also, for example, the uh, energy defined by the angles. So how, for example, here, these uh, triplets of atoms are arranged with respect to these atoms. So this angle plays also a major role. This is what classic uh, chemistry has told us. And this, of course, is completely ignored when we just look at distances, right? Distances are not taking angles, for example, into account. And this is essentially or was the motivation of one of our works in this field here, which we call directional message passing. We wanted to include this direction information, the angular information. And how can we do this? We can just do this by not essentially learning representations for nodes, as we're usually are doing in the, in the GNN community, but we are learning representations for, for edges or directed edges, directed bonds specifically, as you see it here. So we have an underlying direction, right, because we are in this uh, three-dimensional space, and then we are learning representations according uh, along these uh, edges, so to say. So if you want to look at the message passing up, that essentially looks like this, right? You have here an edge representation, directed edge representation, and it takes into account the neighboring edge representation, so to say. And this, of course, very easily, almost trivially, allows us now to incorporate angular information, right? If we have this direction and that direction, we, of course, can compute the angle, and the angle can be fed in also as an additional knowledge into the system. And of course, as well, and also more or less like uh, obvious, 
This, of course, is not invariant to, for example, rotations or translations, right? If we rotate our atom, of course, this angular inflation will not change. So it's invariant to that. And the prediction accordingly will also not change, right? So this is actually a very, very uh, simple, very uh, hopefully easy to understand. Does it actually work? And the answer is yes, it, it, it uh, works uh, surprisingly well. I mean, this is now already two years old, but back then it was a state of the art uh, for, for many, many different benchmarks. So here you see a very famous uh, tiny data set, QM9. But this has led to significant improvements across different predictions we wanted to make here for this data set. It's not important what this is here at the moment for, for the audience, but very different targets. And for all of these, it has led to significant improvements. So incorporating this information indeed helps a lot, exploiting the additional knowledge of angular information. So if you're interested in that, of course, the code is uh, available online. You can download that. And I encourage, of course, everyone to make that code available. And uh, actually, there's also an improved version of that online, which is much more faster than the original model. And there's also another data set, which I just want to advertise here a bit, because I feel that benchmarking is important. And we have also like uh, made public a data set. So if you're interested in more challenging data sets, you might want to have a look there as well. So is that all what we can do? I mean, of course, the answer is no, right? So what else can we do? And this is like a follow up of this. So instead of just looking at the angular information, we can also look at so-called dihedral angles, which essentially are the angles when you have like four atoms now here, and you have here two different planes, as you see it, right? So you have two planes. You can look at this angle here, right? Which is essentially relating to the torsion of these uh, four different uh, atoms here, essentially. Right? Again, this is what the force field tells us, right? We have the, the bonds, we have the angle, and we have this, this torsion information, essentially. And this, of course, what we could also try to include, right? And this is what we did in the GEMNET model. We tried to include this. This, of course, comes with the cost of being much more expensive again, right? Because to compute this uh, dihedral angle, you need to access a two-hop neighborhood, which is usually what you don't do in a classic GNN, right? But to compute this from, for this node, you have to access also this node, right? You have to go two, two hops away, which makes it more expensive to compute, but of course also more powerful, right? And again, without showing you too, here, uh, too much numbers here, and uh, you don't have to read the numbers, of course, anyways. And for, uh, for example, here for force predictions, we are essentially predicting how an atom will so, so they move in space, right? Um, this again led to a super uh, significant improvement here, 40% error reduction for the MD17 data set. And you see here the numbers for this GEMNET approach compared to many competitors, but also compared to the DIMET I've shown you here before. So what is the takeaway here? The takeaway is, yes, we can do better, right? We cannot just use pairwise distances. We can use angles. We can use dihedral angles and so on and so forth. So one question, of course, might now be, are these kind of directional GNNs enough, right? So how much can we add further, right? So do we have to add even more information? Do we have to look at three, four, five, six of neighbors and so on and so forth, right? Or can we not even reach full expressivity? Expressivity means here, can we represent any function, right? Like universal approximation, as you know it from standard neural networks, is that possible with these kind of what we call direct, uh, directional GNNs? So directional GNNs means we only have access to like right the direction information and not to absolute positions in space, so to say. And indeed, the answer is yes, this is enough. What you can show us and what we call spherical representations. So you're operating essentially on the surface of a sphere, which essentially determines for you directions, right? That's enough to have a direction that you're operating on the surface of a sphere. This is enough to represent all functions you're interested in, meaning Again, like invariant to translation and rotation, for example, or equivariant if you're interested in force prediction, for example. So theoretically, these directional GNNs uh, I have shown you here, or which are approximations of directional GNNs, they are enough and you don't need to go to more complicated scenarios where you're operating, for example, on absolute coordinates and uh, so-called irreducible representations, let's say. Okay. So this was the first part, and this is essentially what I guess many of you might have seen already before, um, where we essentially can use graph neural networks as so-called surrogate models. Why surrogate? It means we are replacing an expansion simulation by a surrogate model, by a GNN, by a machine learning model to make it faster. And the first takeaway message here is that this directional information is extremely important to make this all work in practice. On the plus side, 
this is super fast, as you can imagine, right? Once we have trained the model, we can now compute this function here super efficiently, right? It's just one forward pass. And it's actually very accurate. So what we have shown in the previous experiments, essentially we can accurately reproduce what we have in our data. The limitations here, however, are that of course this requires data, right? We have to get access to this database, so to say, to at all train our models and getting this data in the first place might be super expensive. And the second point, and this is a general problem many people are looking at also in the classic machine learning field, we don't know really how they these models will generalize, for example, to new molecules which are outside of our training domain, right? So if you're really far away from our database, so to say, how will these models behave? It's extremely unclear. Then, of course, uncertainty estimates comes into play and so on and so forth, but we don't really have an answer yet. And this brings me then to the second principle, how you can use machine learning in this field, which essentially, I phrase it here as a simple question, do we need training data at all to solve molecular modeling problems to do these kind of predictions I just have shown to you, right? predicting the energies, for example. And for this, I mean, I didn't phrase it uh, in this way, with the answer being, uh, no, we need training data. Of course, the answer is, uh, no, you don't need training data if you follow a different principle, right? And for that principle, we have to look at so-called up initial methods, and you don't have to be scared here if you're not familiar with quantum chemistry. Actually, more or less, I guess every graph researcher will more or less understand what we are doing here uh, on, on some level. Um, what we essentially can do alternatively to find an energy of a molecule is we can solve the so-called Schrödinger equation, which essentially tries to find the underlying wave function. So every molecule, so to say, can be described perfectly by a wave function. Right, So some very complicated function, which we usually cannot compute. But theoretically, we can find it by solving this kind of equation here, where we have the wave function, which get the electrons as an input. We have here the energy, which is what we are interested in. And we have here some Hamiltonian, which not important here, but some of this encodes the geometry. So like the, the, the atoms, how they are arranged in space. Okay. And this should look familiar to many of the graph research here, actually. Right? This is somehow like an eigenfunction problem, right? You're all familiar with page rank, for example, I assume, right? Where you have like also like an eigenvector problem, right? You have like your transition matrix and you try to find uh, the eigenvector with the smallest eigenvalue, for example, right? But this essentially is an is a vector and not a function, right? And indeed the eigenvalue, so to say, corresponds here to the energy, right? So essentially we have to solve this eigenfunction problem to get the energy of our corresponding molecule, right? So just to link it a bit to the graph language, what we are doing here, right? We're solving this eigenfunction problem here. Unlike to computing, for example, eigenvectors in linear algebra and page rank, for example, which is tractable, here it's usually intractable. Okay, so we cannot usually do this exactly. This is not feasible because we have here this uh, very complicated function. But however, we can do it, we can approximate that, of course. We can approximate this by so-called variational quantum Monte Carlo. Again, it's not important that you understand the details, but what it's essentially doing is it picks a family of functions, it's approximating the energy, and then we do some gradient-based optimization to minimize the energy, right? Because again, looking it back to page rank, you know that the smallest eigenvalue, this is what we're actually interested in, okay? So we pick a function, we compute the energy, gradient, optimization to minimize the energy. And then at the end of the day, we have our target energy we are interested in. And this, as you see, does not require any data at all at the moment, right? It's just like we are solving this uh, optimization problem. So where is this machine learning? Right? It's machine learning because on one hand, this function we are optimizing over here, this can be very well be approximated by, for example, a neural network, right? Neural networks are great in approximating functions, right? And let's pick this here. Let's pick a neural network. And then we're optimizing all this with uh, standard uh, auto diff principles. So it's very, very nice to do, essentially. Can we use any neural network here? And actually, the answer is no. And this links it a bit to the first part of the talk. So in the first part of the talk, I said we have to adhere to specific symmetries, right? We have to respect, for example, that we're invariant to rotations or translations. We have specific properties our GNN should fulfill, so to say, to make physically sense. And here the property is that the network has to be anti-symmetric. So we cannot just take any neural network, but we have to have the property if we switch to arguments in our input, 
right? And again, now remember the input are the, the electron positions, right? So we have a neural network which gets electron positions. If we switch the two inputs here, this, uh, the sign will change, right? This is the requirement we have. And the standard solution to achieve this is we essentially use the effect of a determinant, right? So what we do is essentially compute representations for every electron. Then we stack this to a matrix, we compute the determinant, and this is the output of the function. Because the determinant, as you should all know, I guess, if you flip to rows here, which means flipping to arguments, will change the sign, right? So here, compared to what we did in the beginning, where we used angles, for example, so dihedral angles to make sure that we match the property of being invariant, we now use the trick of using the determinant calculation that we are anti-symmetric, okay? So again, we bake this hard, uh, in, uh, in a hard way into our neural network architecture, so to say, the underlying properties we want to preserve. So this has been um, done in a very, very nice way by, by, by other groups, uh, very successfully. And indeed, this leads to extremely very accurate results, much more accurate what, what, what you can do with uh, all the other models. There is, however, one very strong limitation. On one end, it's expensive. Right, and the more important the problem here is that this only works on a single geometry, single molecule, so to say. Right, so we have to fix a molecule, and then we can do this calculation. This, however, is not what we want. Right, we want this entire energy surface, as I mentioned before. Right, we want to generalize to different molecules. This is actually what we are interested in, but this only works for a single molecule, so to say. And this is finally where graph neural networks come into play, where you as a community can contribute to, right? So the underlying idea is essentially that instead of, let me go back actually, instead of computing a single wave function, right, for a specific molecule, we want to adapt the wave function to different geometries, right? So we have here different geometries, and we want to learn how to adapt the wave function to uh, different molecules. And of course, right, GNNs can capture this. They can capture the change in, in like in the geometry. And this is what, what we did here in this work. So on a high level, on, a, on in this illustrative view, essentially we have what we call the meta GNN, which operates on the geometry, on the nuclei and the positions of these, right? It essentially spits out as an output the parameters of, of this wave function. So what we have seen before. And then this wave function essentially here is handled with the so-called wave function model where we try to solve here this, uh, the Schrodinger equation essentially. It's very actual Monte Carlo. And this is then trained end to end, right? We learn this so-called wave function model. So this eigen function we are learning. At the same time, we are learning this uh, meta GNN, which gives us for different geometries the wave function. So this is all done in, in, in one step. And then once this is trained, we can now predict the wave function parameters, so to say, for different geometries. Okay. So this essentially combines the words of um, classic ab initio techniques, eigenfunction problems with GNNs by operating on multiple geometries. Does this work? I mean, the answer is, uh, of course, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't present it here. And probably we can just look at here at this right plot here. So the Fermi net approach, this is uh, the, the classic approach, so to say, which operates on a single geometry. And here you see uh, essentially like the axes are different geometries. So you have the distance between the different atoms, so to say. You're chaining this, you're essentially stretching this out, right? And here for this Fermi net, you have to evaluate or compute it for every uh, geometry individually. This is the orange curve. And our model, the blue curve here, is it doing simultaneously for all geometries? And it, as you see, it's very, very close uh, to this uh, Fermi-net approach and also compared to other uh, competitors. So no loss in accuracy of using this meta GN. But what is the actual benefit, right? The benefit, as I said before, it's now much faster because you simultaneously learn from multiple geometries and you can just look at the numbers. And I guess I don't have to discuss that in too much detail that there's a significant gain in the right term. Okay, so if you listen carefully to what I just said, and I hope it was not too fast, you might have spotted one big issue still with this approach, which is that this meta GNN is actually providing us only with the so-called wave function, right, the wave function. And the wave function is actually not what we're interested in, right? We're interested in the energy, for example, at the end of the day. And I said before, 
very uh, in a very fast way yeah the energy we can somehow compute right and we take the gradient to minimize the energy but actually it's rather expensive to compute this energy right it requires some very expensive monte carlo approximation which you see here right you have to do multiple samples essentially and then you have to do essentially numerical integration which you don't want to do right so this is super expensive so how can we get rid of that and that was the, the final question we we tried to solve in this work how can we get rid of this uh, this expensive uh inference time, so to say, right? Once we have a new geometry, we get the wave function, then we have to do Monte Carlo again. And the trick here is, or the cool idea is, you can essentially inject now another GNN approach, which acts again as a surrogate model as presented in the first part of our presentation. So essentially we have the model I've shown you before, like we have the wave function model, we have a meta GNN, which learns the wave function, but then during the training of the system, we are also learning a surrogate model, so a classic GNN surrogate, which can just get an input in new geometry and then right away spits out the energy, right? So this surrogate essentially avoids computing the wave function than the energy, but it directly predicts the energy. And the cool trick here is that we do this on the fly. By learning this here, by doing the training on the upper part, we also learn the surrogate model. So it's trained while training the other model. So there are also technical challenges, which I don't want to talk about here in too much detail. But as you can imagine, right, because when we're training this, the system is super unstable at the beginning. It's extremely noisy. So what we have to do is this here, the surrogate model cannot be trained in a standard way as you would train it in a standard supervised uh, setting. But you have to train it as like an online learning setting where the information like temporarily changes, it's super noisy at the beginning, becomes uh, more clean at the end. So there are some technical challenges to tackle it, which I can't uh, discuss here today. But you can believe me, we can train this on the fly in a somehow uh, stable way. So to show you potentially the last experiment then, does this work? Yes, it also works quite well. The same experiment as before here, right? You're changing here the, the bond lengths uh, uh, in this experiment. You see here in orange, essentially, uh, our previous model, which was still expensive. And you see in blue here, um, this new technique where we learn the surrogate on the fly. And as you see, as, as we see, right, the surrogate model can reproduce these experiments. So again, no loss in accuracy. But now, the final very, very big advantage, the inference is really, really significantly faster, right? Because classically, you still need to do Monte Carlo approximations. Now you can just do one forward pass through your surrogate model. You get it in, in, in microseconds or milliseconds. And um, yeah, you just get it for free, essentially. Okay, intermediate takeaway. I hope it's not too much for you. So what I've shown you on one end are GNNs for these up initial calculations where you don't need data, where you learn, so to say, the, the wave function, like, like the eigenfunction, like an eigenvector, right? And you learn it in an adaptive way that you can handle different geometries at the same time, okay? This is with the help of GNNC. This is extremely accurate. It's um, more accurate than, and than using like um, DFT calculations that you see in a second. And it's extremely fast compared to similar accurate techniques, okay? When I'm saying similar accurate techniques, I have to zoom out a bit here. Why do I say similar accurate techniques? Because in this field of, let's say, a quantum chemistry, there are various different techniques, how you can compute, like, for example, energies. You can use so-called DFT calculations, dequantum Monte Carlo, what I've shown to you, but there are many other techniques. You can also even do this exactly, right? You just have to wait long enough. So there's always this trade-off between computational cost and accuracy. This is always what you have to take into account here computational cost versus accuracy. And what we are just presented here is essentially we are operating in this domain, right? We are extremely accurate, right? But relatively fast and faster than, um, for example, other techniques in this field here, okay? But for example, we are not as fast as, uh, as DFT calculations, for example, which some of you might know. So this is the first class, right? Ab initio calculations, very accurate, relatively fast. And then I've shown you these GNN surrogate models. And here you have to be careful. This is somehow orthogonal to that, right? Because these GNN approaches, they require some training data. It's a standard supervised learning fit, uh, setting. And they can very accurately fit, or hopefully fit, what your training data shows you. If you want to look at this plot again, however, it is on an 
somehow like on a different axis, right? So you always have to have a reference point. So for example, you can use DFT simulation training data to learn a surrogate model, and then the surrogate model will be much faster, right? But it cannot beat the accuracy of your training data. It cannot get more accurate than your training data. Or if you use this kind of data as a training data, you can learn a GNN surrogate, right? And then you can have the same accuracy in a faster way, okay? So this is what I wanted to show you. These are two very different principles which are uh, tackling different issues. And here is always with respect to some training data that you have gathered before and the accuracy of the training data that cannot be outperformed, of course. And specifically, and that's the last point on, on, on that slide, is what I've shown you at the very end is, you can also learn a, a surrogate model on the fly, right? You use these principles of surrogate models and while training this model, you also train a surrogate and then you also get fast inference for these classes of models. Okay, so the surrogate on the fly idea uh, is what, what we have used uh, in the last approach I've shown to you. So this is essentially the big picture, how at the I mean, current state of the art, more or less, how GNNs are used uh, in, in this domain, right, as surrogate models or for up initial calculations. I guess I still have some time. So um, let me also talk about then the benchmarking, which I promised at the beginning, at least. So I said that, the surrogate models, they accurately fit your data, right? We have seen all these uh, amazing results that we have a very good performance on benchmark data sets and so on and so forth. One issue, and this is a common issue often, of course, in, in early machine learning, let's say, is that these approaches are often evaluated on rather smallish benchmark data sets, right? So it's a bit unclear how these models will actually behave behave in large, diverse systems, going more close to real-life applications, right? And uh, here the video works, that's nice, right? We're gonna see, see here this video, right, of like a, a specific molecule being absorbed by, uh, by a different uh, crystal, right? And you see that these are already many, many atoms, uh, so it's a very complicated setting. And this is the so-called open catalyst data, which actually has not been studied so much yet, relatively speaking, than other data sets. So indeed, if you look at the majority of papers, they have looked, for example, at this MD17 data set I've shown you before, and there's this call data set. Uh, I also uh, pro provided the link before, and so on and so forth. But these are relatively smallish, right? The number of elements is rather small. The average size of the, of the graph, so to say, is rather small. And the training set is uh, also relatively small, right? The other data set I've shown you before, this open catalyst data, is on a very, very different scale, right? You see that the, the properties here are much larger and meaning much more complicated to handle these systems, but of course, much closer to reality, right? So again, the question is, how do models which we have developed here usually, how do they behave on, for example, OC20? So what we did in a very small study is essentially we did some kind of, let's let's call it ablation, right? We took uh, one of our approaches and we deactivated, so to say, different features of the model, right? So this is somehow like testing different architecture, different architectures, different models and how they behave on the data sets. And even for this, you see that we don't really generalize super well, right? So for example, if you look at this here, um, de deactivating this property leads to an improvement for MD17, but a uh, decrease in performance for the other data sets, and so on and so forth. So you sometimes see like different behavior and the magnitude of the change is also quite different. So long story short, what you might have developed for a small data set, which performs very good on a small data set, it might not be good on a more complicated data set. Okay, I mean, this sounds of course trivial, but you should please keep this into account. And what this then means, of course, is we should not, as a community, focus on super simple benchmark data sets, right? And here, what we did is essentially computed some more like the similarity between different data sets by looking how they uh, behave under different model choices. And then we see that this MD17 data set and the OC20 data set, for example, they are not very, very similar. So different model architectures. So on one hand, good for MD17 is very bad for OC20. This is essentially what this tells you. So we should not train on simple data sets. So for you, and this is potentially what you want to look at in the future, is please look at more complicated data sets, like OC20, for example. But 
So this is a super big data set. What we also try to do is for, for the scientific community, we try to design a data set which is smaller in scale so that specifically from an academic perspective, you can also handle this in, in your lab, for example, right? Because not everyone has a super big GPU cluster. So what we did here is we also published some data set which is smaller, but which is well correlated, so to say, to the OC20 data set according to different properties, diversity, data set size, and so on and so forth. So that you can somehow a bit more believe when you develop the technique here, it hopefully also generalizes to OC20. Okay, but again, complex data is what you should really then look at. And the last point I want to make here today is, is what we're actually computing as a performance score actually really good enough in our community? And often what we are just doing is we are looking at benchmark data and benchmark data performance, right? This is a common practice. And this, of course, brings machine learning usually very far, right? What it means here is, we have the standard supervised learning settings. So we have some training data, we have some test data, and we compute some kind of an error, right? Usually some, some error in the, in the energy uh, with respect to, to, uh, to uh, for example, the, the mean absolute error with respect to the forces, for example, right? And then we are comparing different models and we're comparing, for example, different training set size. And we see, oh, this is all nice. This performs great. So we can trust these results and you want to use it, for example, in your real application. Is it actually a good statement? Is it a true statement? And the answer is you have to be a bit careful. Right? You have to be careful that just your test set performance might not tell you the entire story. So what we did in this work is essentially, instead of just using the usual test set performance, we used these approaches in an actual molecular dynamic simulation. So how you would they really use them in some real life application, which specifically means how these simulations work is, they start with a specific like configuration and then essentially they have like a trajectory of steps as you have seen in the video essentially right we are compiling this video we have like our molecule we do a prediction how it will move so to say in space right it will move and then we continue 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 right so essentially we are playing this video by predicting the movement all the time and we do this for 500 million time steps and this is quite realistic right to do because this is what you actually need in practice for example so 500 million time steps in this kind of uh, prediction. And when you do this, it turns out that you might get very different results. So if you look, for example, at this uh, um, bar here, right, we have a, a 3,000, uh, 3K uh, data set size. The, the mean absolute error is quite good, right? Somewhere on the range 10 minus 1 and 10 minus 2. This is test set performance. But if you now consider the performance on this actual real simulation, you see it's significantly larger, right? It's 10 to the zero or even higher, 10 to the one, right? What you see here are different scenarios, different temperatures, so to say, of the system. And you see that here, this small data set behaves bad in all these. This the larger data set still behaves good here, but it also behaves bad here. Again, right? Compare this number to that number, right? Significantly worse, and so on and so forth. So again, test set performance is not the same than real application performance, so to say. And the issue indeed is, what will happen is that these models are somehow leaving their comfort zone, to phrase it simple, right? If you do an actual simulation, what will happen is that you can get very far away from your actual training data regime, whatever this means, yeah, from a, a more formal point of view, right? Specifically, if you're in this kind of high temperature regime, you're reaching regions which are not well covered by your underlying model. Going back to the statement, do these models generalize well, right? And you see here one example, for example, what can happen is that your prediction is very, very good for uh, a couple of steps here, but at some point it behaves very unstable, right? So you see that, for example, here it's, it's, it's cut into, into pieces and then the system behaves very, very weird. Right? You have these pathologies going on, and then you cannot escape from that, simply speaking. And this will always happen when you are essentially leaving your comfort zone, when the model reaches some regions where it doesn't, uh, yeah, where it's not trained for, so to say, right? And, and then it's, uh, yeah, it's not behaving good. And this is what we actually have to check, right? When we want to use this in actual applications, right? We cannot just rely on tested performance, which covers some nice regime, but we have to look at scenarios where we also might enter some regimes which are not so nice. Okay, and this brings me more or less to the conclusion. 
So let me start from the end. So what I said is like the benchmarking uh, scenarios, please make sure that you look for data sets which are comparable in difficulty and complexity than actual scenarios you care about. Don't do just tall data sets. You could, for example, use this O2, OC2M data set as a hopefully reasonable proxy for OC20. And don't just trust the test set performance. You should look at the actual downstream task. This is as a machine learning would call it, right? You should potentially look at the actual downstream task you want to solve. And then how I started today, there are two different views, how you can use GNNs in this field as a surrogate model. So as a proxy, directly predicting properties, which requires training data, but it's super fast and accurate. Or you can directly bake in GNNs and Apinitio calculations, getting super high accuracy. And when you combine this with GNN surrogates, you can also get very, very fast inference time. So this is the end of my presentation. Of course, this has not just been done by myself, but by many uh, great uh, PhD students, postdocs, and master's students. So you see here uh, the names of the people who contributed to this work. So a big thank you to, to these people. And a big thanks also to the audience. And I'm very happy, happy to answer all of your questions. Thanks a lot. OK, no, thank you, Professor Gilliman. This is, this is amazing. Very interesting to me. And I think uh, definitely to many people in our audience, even maybe more interesting and extremely interesting. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you said you're happy to, to answer some questions. So. Um, yeah, we have a lot of them. Let, let's get to that, I would say. Uh, first of all, maybe uh, because you're you're talking about uh, all these models that you developed, right? Uh, such as GemNet and um, DimeNet, uh, we, we have the question, um, and you also showed this plot, right? Where you have the performance compared to the traditional methods that maybe sometimes take a um, a, a long time or you didn't really compare them but you made this point that we cannot uh, increase over the, the training data that we provide uh, to our models of course yeah. right but then um, I'm, I'm sure this point is not where it's uh, where it's actually drawn right there probably is a gap so how large uh, would you say is the gap right now in these methods how much more do we need to put in this yeah Okay, I'm not sure whether I get the entire question. So the, the gap between the surrogates and the simulation or the gap in general in this plot here? No, uh, we mean uh, not the, the gap in computational cost. We mean the, the gap in accuracy. Yes, I mean, okay, A excellent question. And I guess there are different answers to that. So first of all, what you, are, what you can empirically observe is that um, in a classic setting, right, we have our training data and our test data, so to say, for let's say we use DFT simulations and we collect the data set. What the GNN can do, or many of these models, they are predicting so well the test performance, so to say, even more accurate than the accuracy of a DFT simulation, right? So the DFT has, let's say, an accuracy of whatever this now here, there's no access, right? But they, they have some uh, accuracy with respect to the real world, so to say, right? Let's say it's it's one off to the real world. So the GNNs are closer to this DFT than one, so to say, right? So the surrogates are more ac closer to the accuracy of DFT than DFT is clo close to the true world. Was it clear what I'm saying? So there is yeah. there is no actually nothing more to do, so to say, and simply speak. I mean, there's still a lot of work to do. But from an accuracy perspective, I guess we are so close that uh, you cannot call it overfitting in this case because it still generalizes outside the training data, right? But we are so accurate already that you need more accurate training data to get a gain. That's what I want to say. So it's really a bit like what I've drawn here in the plot that this surrogate is more or less really on the same height here. This is really what I'm saying. Okay, then can you maybe uh, then elaborate a little bit on the point of generalization that you're making? Like how yes. how do and we this, find out that we generalize well? Exactly, this, this was the second point I said, because you can answer differently. So we can show this for the given training, uh, for the given test data. For the given test data, it behaves super well as you, as we actually also see here, right? For the given test, test data, it behaves super well, it's super close, right? But if you're then going outside of your usual regime, then we can't make any statements, right? Because we don't know how to prove now 
like generalization performance. I mean, at least I'm not aware of that, that we can do this at the moment. So uh, we don't have any whatsoever guarantees for an, a general setting. And the question is again, how representative is your test data, right? But for the given benchmark data we have, we are super accurate. But again, this was a point I want to make here. And this is, of course, a big limitation, right? Because all the other techniques, like the ab initio techniques I've essentially shown here, right? I mean, this is also true for what I've shown you here. They work from scratch, so to say, on a new scenario, right? Because they, 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 they're not using the standard machine learning kind of supervised training setting, right? So they can be applied to a completely different uh, new molecule, so to say, and you can compute it, right? It can take super long, of course, right? But you can compute it. But this is, so there is no question of generalization, so to say, in, in the upper part. So in the upper part, there is a question of generalization. Here is really the question of generalization, which where we don't have an answer. Probably as an, as an outlook, and there might be people here to call, uncertainty, of course, might be the answer, right? Because what we want, of course, is whenever we are reaching a regime where we are uncertain, right? Where we, I mean, like in this plot, right? The model should become uncertain, right? If we are drifting away from our training regime, we should become uncertain. And then we hopefully should not, or we, if it's reliable, we should not trust the uncertainty as a model anymore and so on and so forth. But again, uncertainty is also still an unsolved issue in this, uh, in this uh, domain. Um, so I have to say, we don't know. We don't know how it behaves outside this regime. Okay, but uh, of course, uh, better than being uncertain and having a calibrated uncertainty would be if we're not uncertain and we're just right and we're able to I generate. completely so, agree. Uh, uh, probably, yeah. probably what we have to do as a community is to look even more, sorry that I'm jumping back all the time, this combination here, probably that's really the way to go, that we combine this ab initio techniques with some surrogate, whether it's on the fly or whatever, right? But that we have to like interwave these, uh, interweave these models, plus some like, I mean, active learning is also uh, um, super important in this scenario. So uh, probably it has to, probably it will not, at the end of the day, it won't be we just train a surrogate model and that's it. That's what I want to say, right? I guess it will be more complicated that we have like, uh, different models playing together, different principles playing together. Okay, perfect. Uh, but then uh, I quickly want to switch gears a little bit because we have many questions uh, in the chat here about your ab initio uh, work and about variation uh, quantum Monte Carlo. I think maybe we cannot go into so much detail here, but can you maybe highlight where people could uh, read up about those and where uh, people who, who, to who should people reach out if they um, want to understand this better and what should they read? I mean, okay, they can reach out to our group, of course. I mean, these works are specifically done in my group with Nicolas Gao, um, who was also mentioned on the last slide. So you can, of course, contact Nicolas Gao. Uh, Frank Noé is also doing a lot of, of work in that field uh, and colleagues from, from Vienna doing a lot in this field. But of course, you can just contact, for example, us if you want. And uh, I, I guess at least biased statement, but our papers, let's say, are definitely easier to read from a computer science perspective, right? If you're a machine learner, you might want to read, for example, our one of our papers, I guess it might be accessible. Uh, probably you don't want to directly jump into quantum Monte Carlo or quantum chemistry uh, literature. So probably as a recommendation, read, read the machine learning papers in this field and contact us if you want, of course. Me, you can also read so me in the Slack. You can reach me in the Slack also afterwards anyways. So I will be available online if you have further questions. Perfect. Thank you for that. So uh, then shoot your questions to Professor Gunnemann on the Slack as well. But yeah, for all of the amazing questions about uh, variational quantum Monte Carlo and um, what exactly um, the, the authors here do in their up initial paper. Um, yeah, if, here's the, the citation in the bottom, sampling free inference for up initial potential energy. Service. That's, the, un exactly. that's <laughs> the unpublished one. That's the published one. Um, oh. You can also check out. But those then, are those are available in the uh, in the in the internet. <laughs> so it's so you just just have a look here. Exactly. That's that's ideal. But then let's get to another question uh, because uh, yeah, your what you showed it seems to work pretty well already for these small molecules and also your um, dimnet gemnet for these small molecules. 
But what do we need to maybe make this work for larger molecules such as proteins? And uh, there also, because you said that if we now include the angular information additionally, then we capture all the 3D information and this is enough, uh, so to say is what you said. Uh, but it's enough in terms of expressiveness, uh, right? So isn't maybe, um, are there other directions that we need? Um, and maybe these directions can be what we need to make it work for larger proteins. What are your thoughts? Yeah, excellent question as well. Uh, first of all, I mean, it's not just the, not the plane angles are enough, right? You need like this, this, uh, what you call theoretical representation, but I, I get your point. Again, I guess at least two answers to the question. First of all, this is, I mean, this is universal. This, you said this would be universal, so fully expressivity, but this of course does not mean that this is from a practical point of view, the best you should do, right? The most expressive model might not be the best model to use, first of all, right? Because it might be super hard to train, for example, right? So this is this is a general point. So expressivity is not everything. Um, also in a general graph neural network community, right? Just because we have an expressive model doesn't mean it's the best for whatever task you're looking at. So that's one point. The other point for, I mean, in principle, you can you can do this for, um, for very large molecules if you have the corresponding data sets to train on. Um, but of course, again, I would I would try to, for example, bake in more knowledge, right? So one one common issue still in this uh, in this field, for example, is like long range effects, for example, which are also not super well covered, right? Like very far away atoms, so to say, sp simply speaking, right? And um, this is something, and I would always try to incorporate again more domain knowledge in this. And what are you actually trying to do, right? Because here we are still predicting energies of forces. Right? But at the end of the day, you potentially have a very different task to, to solve, right? You want to, I don't know, what, whatever docking you are, you are trying to solve or and so on and so forth. Probably it makes sense to look at what are the specificities of the underlying task, and this can be baked in into, uh, in, into the model, right? Then another direction, just to, to open the box here, right? You can also, of course, have a very different view. Let's look at it from a generation point of view, right? So the underlying task might be, I want to... Uh, I want to generate molecules with a specific property, for example, right? And here we did not talk at all, or I did not talk at all about generative models, for example, right? And probably this can be combined also in some or the other way, right? So this, at the end of the day, this is a super tiny piece, I would say, in the big picture, right? Whenever you need to predict energies or forces, or whenever you need energies or forces, you might want to use this as a building block to speed this up, right? But the, the bigger picture might incorporate many, many different points. So I don't have a specific answer to your question, what you should use, of course, but there are so many challenges open um, um, to, to solve actual real world problems um, that I can't give a precise answer, I guess. Okay, but uh, it's uh, interesting thoughts and that's exactly what, what we want here. So you in, in this answer, you said, uh, build in more knowledge to maybe then also be able to work with larger molecules. Um, what do you, because Niels Kriege, for example, he also asked about um, conform ensembles. And like here with Daimler, you may be predicting the properties of a single conformer, but we, we have multiple conformers. We have uncertainty of where the, uh, where the stuff is actually in reality in the 3D configuration. And since you, um, yeah, you also have done some work on uncertainty, like uh, do you maybe see any avenues to incorporate um, flexibility of structures from an uncertainty perspective? Um, so, so yes, this is uh, the first part you said with that with the conformers is correct here. This is not really taken into account that there might be different ones and so on and so forth. That's that's uh, correct, and uh, it, it's a, it's a hard question. Again, I, I I would bounce it back, <laughs> essentially this question to to the general audience or to Niels who asked the question potentially is, I mean, what what is the end task we want to do, right? So why do, in, in which scenario do we, how do we want to exploit it, for example, right? So are we really interested in, in, in these different uh, configurations, so to say, and for, for which purpose, right? And then I guess that would potentially help us uh, to see whether this makes sense at all here in this case, right? Um, so we can use this for uncertainty. I, I'm a bit skeptical to be a bit more specific to, to say we have like, let's say high uncertainty, 
because uh, I mean, what do we want to predict? For we, we are not predicting here the 3D positions. Let's be specific on that, right? We are pred predicting not the positions. And then, of course, you could argue that there might be uncertainty in the predict in the prediction of the positions, right? And then you need larger uncertainty because there is no single answer to that, right? But again, this is a different question. Then um, we are we are tackling yeah. here, and the question is: Do we want to? really predict directly the 3D positions? Or do we want to have more like we're predicting forces and then we're doing molecular simu so the MD simulations essentially to reach a position? I mean, this is what I mean is we have to take the bigger picture into account, right? I mean, super great questions, okay. I have to say, but uh, many different answers to that. I mean, what we actually also did is uh, in the GEMNET uh, model, I don't know where it is, there is a task where you directly predict, for example, the relaxed state of a molecule, right? You have a molecule, and instead of predicting forces, and you do the trajectory, so to say, right, where it ends, you can also directly try to predict the end state, so to say, right? The end of the trajectory, mm -hmm. simply speaking, right? You can do this, and there is a task like this. I'm not convinced that this is really a good task, and we should do that. But I mean, <laughs> and of course, it's much more challenging, right? It's much more challenging to do. and. Um, I would prefer at the moment, at least, that we do it like step by step because then we have a bit more control over the process, right? I mean, of course, if we can do the big jump, great. We have solved a very big problem, but even the tiny steps are already challenging as I've shown you, right? In this instable setting, right? If you do these tiny steps, it becomes instable at some point. So why, at the moment, I don't see that we can really in a reasonable way do the big jump directly at the end. Okay. Long answer to, to, to a tiny question, but I mean, um, would love to discuss it more in detail, of course. Okay, that is that is very great to hear uh, because, because uh, we would love if it can discuss a little more in the Slack. Uh, and yeah, with that, I would uh, then we, we we have many other interesting questions like people are interested in for example what do you think because you're a big uh, big on benchmarks uh, what do you think could be good bench better benchmarks for generative models for molecules because there is always hard to evaluate and yes, so on yes. yeah <laughs> very good uh, question be, and we have uh, also many people who disagree with your uh, view of not predicting the end state and instead doing oh, the full nice. simulation. So I, I think it could be an excellent discussion in, in the keynote uh, channel on, on Slack. And we are very grateful for any additional minutes that you have to answer questions there. And uh, then uh, if you have any last words, uh, let's, let's go with that uh, before we wrap it up. No, last words have to go again to to uh, I have to scroll to the very end. Last words again. Thanks to to the amazing uh, collaborators here, and uh, again thanks for inviting me. I hope uh, the conference will survive for many many years. That it becomes really a prestigious venue. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to it, and I guess the community is very strong. So let's all contribute to that. These are my last words. <laughs> okay. Awesome, Professor Gunnarman, and thank you for your contribution to making this uh, as great as it is. All right, yeah. then with that, let us move on to the orals, which are next, right? And uh, maybe I'll just very quickly uh, share share my screen, right, everyone? We, we remember that we have our schedule here. You can find the schedule on our website, logconference.org. And there you also have the, the Slack link, uh, which you can join. And you will always stay updated this week if you are in our Slack. But then uh, let me please hand over to Julia, um, who will go ahead with our orals. Hello, hello. Uh, hope you enjoyed the amazing talk from Professor Stefan Gunemann. Uh, now we'll have our first spotlight session containing three papers. Each presentation will be 20 minutes long, so we encourage you to ask questions using either the Q&A section from the webinar or the Slack channels or whatever channels you want to communicate with. Uh, in case there is not enough time to address them, we will export them on the Slack in the oral discussion channel, and it would be amazing if our authors have enough time to address them there. We really encourage people to talk to each other and really create a community around uh, this conference. So it's really, really important for you to ask questions and talk to us. Uh, but enough on my side, I think Nicolas Kerivan is here with us. So if you yep. can please Hello. share your screen, Nicolas. So yeah, I'm sharing my screen. 
screen. Here you go. Is that okay? Uh, yes. Uh, the first spotlight paper from today is not too little, not too much, a theoretical analysis of graph over smoothing. So, Nicolas, the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, thanks a lot and congratulations to the organizers for this. Uh, what will be, I'm sure, an amazing conference uh, for many years to come. Uh, so, I'm very glad to present this work today. Um, it's a bit intimidating to be the first uh, for all, <laughs> but uh, okay, I do my best. Uh, okay, so this was submitted as an extended abstract, actually, uh, of a new research paper that was presented last week and in the beginning of this week, so it's a continuation for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so in this work, uh, I'll try to analyze some vertical properties of uh, something that is very well known for you in this community, uh, which is the over smoothing phenomenon that happens for a graph neural network. Okay, so without further ado. Okay, so since I'm only the second talk, you're not uh, tired of this equation yet. This is the message spacing equation. I guess you're all very familiar with it. Uh, so this is how most vanilla graph neural network uh, uh, function. At each layer, you have uh, nodal connotations. So here I'm calling them uh, ZI, uh, and they are gonna be propagated uh, along the edges of the graph. And the next representation is gonna be computed by aggregating uh, the message from its neighbors uh, along the edges, right? For some aggregation function, and we all know that uh, the important part here is that this aggregation function is a uh, permutation invariant. It, it does not uh, assume an ordering on the neighbors, unless you have, of course, uh, more knowledge like we had in the previous talk, for instance. Okay, so in this work, I'm gonna look at one of the most classical aggregation function, I would say, for which the over smoothing phenomenon is very, very uh, powerful. It's the mean aggregation. So at each layer, after doing some transformation on the message of my neighbors, like some MLP, for instance, I'm gonna aggregate by uh, doing the mean of uh, the message of my neighbors. So if here AIJ is the weight of the edges between i and j. So it can be zero or one for unweighted graph, or it can be a weight. Uh, I'm doing the mean by performing uh, each weight a sum of weighted messages and divided by the sum of all the weights, right? So just in terms of notation to be more convenient, uh, if I stack the messages as a row of a big matrix Z that contains all the nodal notation, uh, doing this mean aggregation operation, which is really what's interesting for me here, is performing a multiplication by uh, the random walk Laplacian, so the adjacent matrix times uh, D minus one, where D is the diagonal uh, matrix of the degree, as usual. Okay, so over smoothing, uh, I guess you all know uh, more or less what over smoothing refers to here. It's the fact that uh, people have observed that when a GNN, or at least a vanilla GNN, uh, um, becomes 2D, if it has too many layers, then since each uh, message spacing round tends to uh, promote the fact that the node representations are more similar to each other, um, the, the, the representation of the nodes uh, become almost constant or at least non-informative over the graph if you have too many layers and you do too many rounds of message spacing, right? So in my case, for instance, since I, I multiply by the, uh, by the random walk Laplacian, if I discard the non-linearity for now, uh, it's very easy to, to, to show, it's very well-known ergodic theorem, that multiplying an infinite number of times by uh, the random book Laplacian will lead to a constant over all nodes. So here I'm losing all information. I do not even have the degree. Uh, I'm losing all information over my graph. So this happened in practice. So a very um, easy visualization, for instance, on Cora, I'm taking Cora along the uh, two most principal, direct uh, principal directions over the node representation. When I smooth, everything collapses to a constant and then I cannot learn anything, right? So this is very well understood theoretically, but on the other hand, when we want to analyze the uh, theoretically the graph neural network, usually we put ourselves in an infinite number of layers and we assume that we don't have over smoothing. So for instance, for the vice Peller Lehman, we assume that all maps between each layer, each layer is injective, for instance, to have the node uh, color refinement uh, phenomenon and stuff. Or we assume that we have some operators over the edges, some, some other prior knowledge that allows us to model the diffusion process uh, when the number of lawyers goes to infinity uh, that do not over smooth, right? So we have this kind of two phenomena, but what appears is that for now, most theoretical analysis of GNN, they are in the infinite num uh, layer limit or 
very simple one or two layers, but uh, yeah, here in the oversmoothing, either we oversmooth because we replace ourselves in a model where, was, where we oversmooth, or we assume that the genome is powerful in some sense and we analyze the, the limit uh, without restraints on the number of years. So what I wanted to see is, okay, if I force myself to be in a situation where I know that I will oversmooth because we observe that in practice, can I at least say something in the middle regime here? Can I prove that before oversmoothing, some layers is at least good. It's at least better than nothing, right? So yeah, so that's what I'm gonna, that's what I, I did in this paper in very, very simple situations. You're gonna see it's a very idealized model for ENR genin and stuff like this. But yeah, in some situations we are able to see, okay, we are going to oversmooth, but at least some smoothing is good. So most importantly, um, we want to understand why this happens. And basically the take home message in the few analysis that I did in the very uh, synthetic idealized case that I analyzed is that, okay, smoothing like mean aggregation collapses the not representation, but not everything collapses at the same speed. And so the speed at which structures in the graph collapses is also important for learning. So for instance, if you look at Cora here, you can see that, okay, in the limit, I'm gonna have a constant, so I cannot learn anything. But before that, the communities are gonna be um, better separated with some smoothing rather than in the initial not representation, right? So this is the initial not representation, and this is for, uh, I think, five uh, layers of message space, something like this. Okay, so yeah, now I'm gonna dive a bit into the technical details, but that was basically the take home message. So. Okay, so I need some model for my graph and my node features uh, to be able to analyze what happens when I'm, I'm performing mean aggregation. So for this, I'm taking a very classical random graph model uh, with deterministic edges and do not consider Bernoulli edges here for simplicity. So basically the node features XI are gonna be generated IID uh, along with the label YI according to some joint distribution P. Uh, my edges are gonna be weights uh, between, the two, um, between the two latent variables XI and XJ that I do not observe. I'm taking some Gaussian kernel plus some technical stuff here because I, I do not want my, my weights to be zero, basically. I need my degree function to be bounded away from zero. Um, and the most, I would say the most original and important part here is how the node features are related to the latent variable, basically. Uh, so here I'm assuming that my node features that I observe, zi, are a lower dimensional projection, linear projection of my latent variable xi. Uh, uh, according to some matrix M, and I'm assuming nothing about M here, uh, just that it reduces the dimension of the latent variable. And especially here, I do not assume that M satisfies, for instance, the Johnson, Lee, and Strauss lemma or something like this. There is lots of information between the latent variable that I do not know and the node features that I observe. So for instance, here on a very simple example, uh, my X, my latent variable are 2D. There are two, two Gaussians that are very well separated. Uh, but I when I project them uh, onto the first coordinate, for instance, assuming that this is the Z that I observe, then they are much less separated and they are much more difficult to separate. Actually, you can directly compute the Bayes error and it's much higher in this case than in this case. So my question is, can mean aggregation and only mean aggregation, I do not perform spectral clustering or anything here, I could have, but here I'm really interested in mean aggregation. Can mean aggregation on the node features help recover some information about the latent space, the latent variables and the labels before oversmoothing occurs. Because here I know that uh, in the limits, if I multiply by the, sorry, by the random work Laplacian, I'm gonna converge to a constant. Okay, just to finish with the settings, uh, as I told you, uh, I do not take any nonlinearities here because it's too complicated. <laughs> so I'm considering linear GNNs uh, so it's just smooth features. So I'm taking the node features Z and I'm smoothing them K times. And then I'm predicting uh, my labels uh, as a linear combination of those uh, smooth non uh, node features, right? Uh, I'm placing myself in a classical semi-supervised learning setting. So I have a training nodes uh, and I have test nodes. And I'm basically assuming that uh, they are chosen randomly and uh, the number of them are proportional, is proportional to the, to the total number of nodes. It's not very important for me in, in this uh, phenomenon. Of course, this would be very important in other cases, but here it's not, it's not the, what I'm uh, interested in. I'm computing my uh, optimal regressor in a read regression context for simplicity because it has a closed form, but on my uh, smooth node features. That's what, uh, that's what is important here. I have the ZK here. 
And I'm computing my test risk on my test node features, right? So already, as I told you, it's very easy to show that when k, which is the order of smoothing, goes to infinity, then my zk will go to a constant, and I cannot learn anything. Uh, and I cannot learn anything. So uh, basically, my test risk will become uh, non-informative. And my question is, can I show that there exists, with high probability, a, an order of smoothing k star that is strictly above zero, such that the risk for k star is strictly below the risk for doing anything, uh, for doing uh, nothing, or the risk uh, of over smoothing, right? I want to know that there's a middle regime where k star is better than uh, doing nothing or doing an infinite number of smoothing. OK, so I have some theorem. So for instance, in the regression settings, I consider that my uh, latent variables are distributed according to some Gaussian with the covariance sigma. And uh, my labels are um, the true, the true ground truth uh, with the ground truth regressor beta star. No noise for now, because it's for simplicity, it's not very important for the analysis. And basically, I have a condition. So I encourage you to look at the paper, because it's a quite complicated condition. But if stuff are well aligned in a certain way, and I have sufficiently many data, then uh, k star, the order of smoothing will exist. The optimal order of smoothing will exist. And basically, the explanation for that, sorry, I'm going to go a bit fast here. But the explanation for that is that I can almost compute how the smooth data are going to behave. Basically, it's going to be a modification of my covariance with the order of smoothing k here. And so the explanation is that what does that do? It, it, it's the fact that uh, for the latent variable, the um, direction corresponding to the low eigenvalue of my covariance are going to shrink faster, according to this expression here, are going to shrink faster than the large eigenvalue. So everything is going to shrink because at the end of the day, I'm collapsing to a single point, but not everything collapses at the same, at the same speed. And if, if things are well aligned, then uh, it's going to help the learning before over smoothing occurs. So for instance, in this first example above here, I can say that my graph is more or less homophile in the sense that nodes that are closed in latent space are going to have similar labels. So when I smooth, it's going to reduce some noise in my uh, node features. So this is, again, the latent variable and the node features uh, and the labels here. It's going to make the um, regression of the labels uh, with respect to the node features more and more clean because I'm reducing the width of useless direction in my latent variable, basically. On the other hand, if stuff are not well aligned, and basically here the, the direction is not the principal direction of the latent uh, variable, then I'm going to increase my noise, and smoothing will not help in this case. Uh, I can say, yeah, by hand that this is more or less a heterophilous graph. I'm taking some, uh, yeah, some caution here. Uh, but here, yeah, nodes that are close by are gonna can have very different labels, and nodes that are far away can have very similar labels. So in some sense, there's a tiny connection to homophily versus heterophily. Um, but yeah, it's just to put a name on 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 phenomena. Yeah. Of course, hetero homophily and heterophily are much more general than this. Uh, the proof is not that simple, even though the explanation is very simple, because as soon as I smooth my data, all my rows of my uh, node matrix become dependent. So if I want to do concentration equalities, which, uh, which is what I do, uh, it's not that simple. Let's just say it's, it's chaining in some way, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's just not, it's not just the central limit here. I mean, it's, it's a, a bit more than that, just uh, as, a, as, a, as a note. Yeah. OK, as a second example, uh, we can do classification. So here, I'm considering that, for instance, I have two communities, uh, so two Gaussians for my data according to mu and minus mu, uh, with mean mu and minus mu, and labels 1 and minus 1. And my conclusion here is that if the data are su sufficiently separated in the latent space, not necessarily in the node feature space, but in the latent space, and my node feature, my projection matrix on my node feature is not exactly aligned with the mean, of course, otherwise the, they're going to be confounded in the node features, then k star exists. And the explanation for that is even simpler than the previous case. Basically, the communities, everything will collapse, but the communities are going to collapse onto themselves faster than they're going to collapse together. So you can see here, when I smooth, the communities are leaking a bit into each other, of course, because I'm performing global smoothing. But they are shrinking faster a bit than they're collapsing together before everything collapses and over smoothing occurs. And this shrinking onto themselves, this, this uh, 
shrinking of the communities, this helps separating the communities more and more in the observed node features. And so this, this helps the learning, basically. And then everything collapses and, uh, and uh, you oversmooth. So here the theory is a bit uh, less powerful in, in predicting the, the error of oversmoothing. Basically, I have only a big O, while on the previous slide, I had a very like, quite precise expression for the oversmoothing case. But here, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit more difficult than that. Okay, so to conclude, this was very idealized, very simple, uh, linear genes and everything. But yeah, what's important for me is the take home message and the idea that not everything needs to be asymptotic. And uh, in some cases, at least, we can analyze the middle ground uh, with some ideas out there. And there are links with heterophily and homophily. Um, my hope is that these ideas, it's a very preliminary work, but these ideas can help uh, with to help combat oversmoothing in GNNs, basically. In, instead of uh, doing normalization or drop out of the edges a bit indiscriminately, maybe um, incorporate the knowledge that there is some communities in the graph or there are some directions that are more useful than others. And if you incorporate this knowledge into the graph neural network, maybe this can both help the learning and reduce the oversmoothing. And, and basically what's the question out there, which is more interesting for me and more global is, here I presented a model with uh, some relationship between the labels, node features, and the graph structure. Everything is interconnected, and I have seen some phenomena emerging. But of course, it's not the only possible labels, uh, the only possible model, or the only possible interpretation. And, and uh, I guess that there will be many interesting uh, uh, stuff to say about this kind of model uh, and how realistic they are. Also. Uh, so yeah, again, the full paper it was on your website, so you can you can look that up for the details. And I'll be happy to answer any questions on Slack or, or directly. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nicolas. Uh, there are a couple of questions and we have one more minute. So I'll try to be sure. quick in this. And if you have time to answer in Slack, it would be amazing. Sure. Uh, the first question is from Fatima. She says, uh, regarding GNS, I've read multiple sources that say that they are as powerful as WL test, but some GNS claim more accuracy than the WL test. How does that become possible due to different variations? Yeah, okay, so usually the GNNs that are more powerful than one vice uh, um they use different um, different structures. So it's not vanilla message passing, but uh, usually you can use either higher order stuff or use subgraphs. Sub uh, yeah, there are many strategies to be more powerful than vice lehmann And usually you can order the GNN according to some hierarchy of vice lehmann tests, so one vice lehmann two vice lehmann et cetera. Um, here, in, what's interesting here, what I'm, I'm looking at uh, with the mean aggregation, repeated mean aggregation, is not even one vice file element. It's even worse than that because when you have a smooth, you are not one vice file element. So, yeah, here I'm not even one vice file element. I, I have a smooth in the limit, so uh, I have to be more careful than, than that. Okay, uh, the next question comes from Chaitanya. They say, uh, what are your thoughts about the oversmoothing problem in the context of the recent rise of graph transformer architecture, where we essentially, pa uh, pa where we essentially pass messages over the full graph with or without informative structural positional encoding? Yeah, okay, so, um, okay, I've not talked about attention network. Of course, if you put attention coefficients on the edges, this can change a lot if they are well computed. Uh, one could have thought that transformer would oversmooth a lot because the graph is complete, so it's like the, the worst case for oversmoothing. Uh, but then again, the attention coefficients are absolutely crucial in this case. Um, so I'm not a specialist of transformer, but it seems that in some cases you have enough uh, data, enough, uh, enough uh, sufficiently good positional encoding such that you don't really oversmooth. Uh, yeah, again, I'm not a specialist on, on transformers, so I don't want to say uh, stuff like this. But when you have attention coefficient, it can become a very different picture, of course. Um, again, in practice, uh, on most vanilla data set that we have, even graph attention network over smooth. So I'm guessing that there are other phenomena coming into play. Like there are graph attention networks that do not over smooth. We, we are just not able to find them with, with our training by gradient descent. Uh, so there are probably other stuff coming into play here, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. There are a couple of more questions. So if you can have a look on the Slack, it would be amazing. Yeah, sure. Otherwise, thank you so much for the for the talk. Uh, now I think that we have uh, Yuhong Luo with us. Yeah. Can you I'm please uh, share your screen? 
Sure. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The paper is called Neighborhood Aware Scalable Temporal Network Representation Learning. So, Can you uh, see my screen? Uh, it's loading, yes. I can see. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Today, I would like to present our work on neighborhood aware scalable temporal network representation learning. My name is Yu Hong Luo. This is a joint work with Professor Pandy of Purdue University during my summer internship. So I guess uh, all the audience here agreed that uh, representation learning for graphs or network is important. Today, I would like to focus on a more complex type of networks that evolve over time, which is the temporal networks. Temporal networks is widely used to model um, practical dynamic interactive systems. For example, the email networks, social networks, and so on. Our goal is to predict how temporal network evolves over time, or basically uh, to predict links there is a wide range of applications for interaction predictions. For example, if we model the user item interactive behaviors, we can make predictions um, to make recommendations. We can also detect network anomalies if we detect an uh, interaction that shouldn't have happened according to our prediction. Overall, predicting how temporal network evolves helps us understand a complex interactive system. So um, to motivate our approach, I would like to highlight our understanding on temporal networks from the perspective of network science. So researchers have found that temporal networks typically evolves according to some fundamental laws that describes the dynamics of the complex system. For example, in social networks, it evolves usually according to the law called triadic closure. The explanation behind this is that if two people know a common friend, then they are likely to know each other in the future, even though they don't know each other right now. Another law, called feedforward control is commonly seen in biology. Now let's take a look at whether previous models can capture those laws. So most of the previous temporal network uh, architecture tries to extend the graph neural network to temporal network. However, we argue that this JNN type model cannot capture the structural features that involve multiple nodes of interest. Let's take a look at this example. We show a toy temporal network. We want to ask whether U is to connect with node V at T3, time, uh, timestamp T3, or to connect with node W at T3. Intuitively, U and V are more likely to connect <clears throat> because of triadic closure. So they have a common neighbor, node A, but U and W don't have common neighbors. However, GNN type model cannot uh, model this, uh, cannot predict well in this case. It is because B and W are symmetric. They have the same computation graph and the model will fail to distinguish them. More fundamentally, JNN type model fail to uh, construct structural features around this U, A, and V neighborhood that implies triadic closure. This problem is naturally carried over to temporal networks. So there has been a lot of works done on static graphs to address the issue interested audience may want to check these papers. But let's uh, give a brief example on one uh, mechanism is the distance encoding. So to predict whether U and V has an edge, 
it associate the neighbor A with an extra feature one one that uh, denotes the shortest path distance to U and the shortest path distance to V. Essentially, this, uh, this idea is to construct the structural feature. However, the problem is how do we generalize the static graph ideas to temporal networks in an effective and scalable way? There is one previous work uh, called CAWN that captured the structural feature over temporal networks. However, CAWN has a huge computational overhead. Basically, it needs to sample multiple random walks for each query node pair based on the historical events. It also needs to construct the relative positional encoding online. And both of these operations are very time consuming. Now let's uh, take a look at our approach called Neighborhood Aware Temporal Network or NET. It has two high level design. The first is the dictionary type node representations that can construct structural features efficiently while avoiding the expensive online neighborhood or walk sampling. The second design is called neighborhood cache that maintains those dictionary representations completely and efficiently. We won't go into much detail about the neighborhood cache because it is more involved. Interested audience uh, can check our paper or um, come to a poster session to discuss more. Now let's take a look at the dictionary type no representation. The key idea is as follows. Uh, many previous works track a long vector representations for each node in the memory. Here, we don't use such a long vector representation anymore. Instead, we use the dictionary to represent a node. This dictionary records a downsampled historical neighborhood of a particular node. Let's use this um, toy network again. Suppose we are at time T3. For the dictionary of U, the key sets are the downsampled neighbors of U based on the previous interactions. So A is in the first hop of U and V and B are in the second hop of U. The values are short vector representations that have some physical meaning. Let's take this uh, representation for A as an example. It summarizes the past interactions between U and A when A is the first top neighbor of U. This is not a representation for one single node, either A or U. It is representation for this node pair. Note that this vector representation is typically very short. Only uh, two to eight dimension is enough in our experiment. So the overall memory cost is comparable to previous models. So um, how does the dictionary representation help us achieve these two goals? Let's take a look at an example. Suppose now we have the dictionary representation for all nodes and we want to predict at time T3, whether U is going to connect with V. Now we don't need to run the neighbor sampling anymore. We only need to aggregate these two dictionary representations according to the key set. To construct the structural features, we use the relative precision encoding. The idea is as follows. For example, for node A, since it appears in the first hop neighborhood of U and V, we concatenate to 0, 1, 0 vectors. This 0, 1, 0 vector denotes that A is in the first hop. So this vector can indicate that A is a common neighbor between U and V. 
it captures the joint neighborhood structural features between U and V, as we mentioned previously. So other than the relative position encoding, we also aggregate the short vector representations. They work just like traditional vector representations. We do the above uh, computations for all nodes that appears in the key set in parallel. One important note here is that uh, our model combines structural feature construction based on the keys and the traditional vector representation based on the values. Combining these uh, relative precision encoding and the traditional vector representation, we can make our final prediction. As we can see here, we abandon the neighborhood sampling and we also do the construction of the structural features in parallel, which saves us a lot of time. So let's now take a look at uh, evaluation of our model. We do two kinds of experiments. The first is inductive, the second is transductive. For inductive, uh, we split our nodes into two sets, the old nodes and the new nodes. During training, only the connections between the old nodes will appear. And during testing, we predict the links that's attached to the new nodes. Transductive is simpler. We train on all links up to a certain point in time and evaluate on the remaining. Below, we show the statistics of the data sets we use. Uh, Note here, we use a relatively large data set, Wikitalk, that has more than 1 million low nodes and 7 million edges. Let's first take a look at our prediction performance. So as you can see, NAT achieved the first place in almost all evaluations. CWN is also uh, pretty good. And we think it's because both NAT and CWN captures the structural features. But NETS also leverage the benefits of the traditional vector representations. We also evaluate on the computation and scalability of our model. The hardware is listed above. The below two plots shows the training dynamics. So it's the walk clock time of training versus the prediction performance on the validation set. So as you can see, our model achieved very high accuracy in very short time. We also show some time usage of our model and uh, our model runs the fastest. It's uh, about two to four times faster than TGN PG and implementation of TGN in PyTorch geometric. In inference, uh, they are comparable. Now I would like to summarize my talk. Here are some key takeaways. Uh, structural features from a joint neighborhood of multiple nodes are crucial. For example, the triadic closure to predict temporal network evolution. However, previous models either cannot capture such structural features or it takes a lot of time. So we propose NETS that uses the dictionary type representation and combines structural feature construction with traditional vector representations. And we construct such structural features online efficiently through parallelism and avoiding neighbor sampling. We see a potential of the dictionary type representations in the general uh, temporal network task 
and we would like to apply it to broader uh, to improve broader tasks such as no classification and fraud detection. So I would like to thank you uh, everyone for listening. Our paper and code are both online. So feel free to take a look and comment and uh, feel free to ask questions. Thank you so much, so much for the presentation. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, Mahdi asks, can you elaborate on why the performance of the inductive setting is higher than the transductive settings generally? Is not the inductive setting a harder task? So, yeah, let me come back to this. Uh, actually, inductive settings overall is uh, less performance than transductive. And I think in some cases, uh, inductive setting is better because it's um, we we can generalize it to the new nodes, and our model is able to capture the structural feature and be less reliant on the node and edge features. So it's able to generalize better in inductive settings. Does that answer the question? Uh, thank you so much. And another question, uh, maybe I missed some points, but if uh, uh, A links U at T1, then if A links B at T2, do you always expect to see V links U at T3? If so, is this a relevant assumption? Oh, so uh, I think this is just to uh, simplify the uh, temporal networks. It's not necessarily at T3, but it can be at some certain point in the future. And uh, we so we encode these temporal features as well. So I think there are some dynamics in the temporal features that can help us predict in what time in the future they are going to connect. Thank you so much. Uh, please continue to ask questions for Yu Hong in, uh, in yeah. the Slack. And thank you so much again for the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and now I think uh, Borja Ibar is with us and also Petar Velishkovic. It will be yes. a shared presentation between these two. And uh, they'll talk about their paper, A Generalist Neural Algorithmical Learner. So the stage is your guys. Thank you. Let me share the screen. Let's see. Can you see my slide? Oh. Uh, not yet on my side. Um, okay, let me try. Let me see. Try again. Um, Mm. So I'm sharing, but it looks like it, um, it, well, it says I'm sharing the screen, but I cannot see it in the common video feed, but I see that it says I'm sharing it. So um, yes, it oh, you says, can see it. No, no, it just says you have started screen sharing, uh, but we cannot see your screen yet. Mm. Um, ah, now, now I'm seeing a generalist neural algorithmic learner. I think only when you are in full screen mode, you, we can see your screen. So maybe when, you share just a tab. When you are in full screen mode, I, we can yeah, see uh, Let me tell you, because I, I tried sharing um, a window. Uh, let me try sharing the just a tab, if that works. Just a second, let me find the... That's no problem. Uh, we're all used to the the zooms and the zoom problems, and uh, it's I think it's it's fine to have a few seconds for our att attendees to relax from this. Uh, yeah, great great oral so far. Um, yeah, I I would love to have some of these papers in the reading group to discuss them in more detail. Um, maybe. Um, Petar, can you share because we have the presentation, both of us? Yeah. Can you share? Yeah, let's share? try. Because uh, yeah. so 
I no, hope no, no, you no, can no. see this. Yes, yes correct. I can see it, so it should be fine. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Yuhong and Nicola for very interesting talks. Uh, I am Borja, and together with Peter, I am going to be presenting our work on a generalist neural algorithmic learner. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. First of all, I want to acknowledge uh, our co-authors. Um, so together with Peter and me, uh, Vitali, George, Kiriakos, Mehdi, Robert, Andrew, Matko, Alex, Julia, Andrea, Beatrice, Jaroslav, and Charles have contributed to this work. So it's a, it's a relatively big group effort. Next slide. Our uh, starting point is the question, uh, can a neural network learn to execute classical computer science algorithms? Uh, think, for example, of Dijkstra's uh, shortest path algorithm. Uh, if we encode the inputs into high dimensional features and learn to execute the algorithm in high dimensional space, then perhaps we can apply the algorithmic knowledge to natural inputs and obtain results in terms of natural outputs by swapping in new encoders and decoders for those natural inputs and outputs, but reusing the learned algorithmic processor. Um, next slide. Besides, if these differentiable computer scientists, so to speak, can learn various algorithms at the same time in the same high dimensional space, then it might become a foundational model for algorithmic reasoning in general. Next slide. This idea of neural algorithmic processor uh, is not new, and it has been attempted uh, before with different architectures, as, uh, such as LSTMs, as in the differentiable neural computers, uh, transformers, as in the universal transformer. Uh, there is also some, some work on recurrent covnets, and GNNs. Uh, we think that GNNs are particularly well suited for algorithmic tasks, and that's why we are here. Next slide. Um, in order to put this idea into practice, we have created a benchmark of 30 algorithms from the CLRS book. This is a very popular standard book in many universities for computer science related degrees. Um, and this CLRS benchmark covers a diverse uh, set of algorithmic areas. This includes sorting, searching, divide and conquer, greedy, dynamic programming, graphs, strings, and geometry algorithms. Next slide. The benchmark is open sourced, and we have previously published uh, GNN baselines uh, for each of these tasks. Next slide. All the algorithms in the benchmark have been reduced to a common graph representation. Each algorithm is defined by a number of probes, and here I am showing the probes for the specific example of insertion sort. A probe can be an input, an output, or a hint. The inputs and the outputs do not have a time dimension, but the hints do have a time dimension because they specify the intermediate states of the algorithm. Um, all the algorithms uh, have a positional input. This is the first probe that you see there called uh, pause, and this establishes the ordering of the nodes for those algorithms that need to disambiguate between different nodes. And then for the case of insertion sort, we have a key input, uh, which is actually the values that we want to sort. And there is an output. The output is uh, the sorted order of the nodes, and it's specified as pointers from each node to its predecessor in the order. These inputs and outputs are common to any kind of sorting algorithm, but there are now three additional hints that you can see here, pred H, I, and J, which are specific to the insertion sort execution uh, step by step. Next slide. Um, the process uh, works the following way. The network consists of encoders, uh, GNN processor, and decoders. First, each input is projected by a simple encoder, uh, just a linear layer, to a high dimensional feature space. These features can go to the nodes or the edges of the GNN as specified in the probe definition that you saw in the previous slide. The size of the graph corresponds with the size of the problem in the, in the case of sorting the length of the list that we want to sort. And the same encoder is applied on all the nodes or all the edges in the case of uh, features that go to the edges so that the network can generalize to different problem sizes. 
In this slide, I'm showing how the POS input, which establishes the node order, is encoded into node features. Next slide. Uh, the different inputs are encoded by separate encoders and they are added together in feature space. So here you can see how the keys to be sorted are encoded as node features, just as the POS, and they are added to the positional features that we encoded in the previous slide. Next slide. The hints, that is, as I said before, those inputs that specify the steps-by-step -step execution of the algorithm are encoded and added just like the inputs. So both hints and inputs uh, uh, are processed in the same way. Those hints or inputs that produce edge features, like the predecessor pointers in the case of sorting that I am showing in this slide, those can additionally define the adjacency matrix of the graph for those GNM processors that take the adjacency into account. Next slide. Here is how we encode and add the two remaining hints in the case of insertion sort. Uh, this, according to the pro definition, are one hot masks over the nodes. And once all the hints and inputs have been encoded, next slide, the GNN has all the node and edge features ready to be processed. Next slide. The GNN has a hidden state for recurrent computations. Next slide. And what it does is it computes the next hidden state from the current state and the features. Uh, we have implemented a variety of GNN processors, mainly of two types, uh, message passing and attention based. Notice that the processing step is agnostic to the algorithm. That is, the processor parameters are the same for any set of probes once, this, once these probes have been encoded as, as node or edge features. And this is what allows us to learn several algorithms in the same processor network. Uh, once we have processed the features into the next hidden state, a simple set of linear decoders predicts the next step hints for the execution uh, and the next uh, um, from sorry the next step hints from the features and the hidden state the hint predictions are post processed to feed them back on the next step as new hidden, uh, as new hint inputs and this is necessary at evaluation time where we don't have access to the hints uh, but optional at training time at training time we can use the ground truth hints for training uh, also the output is decoded uh, from the features and hidden state at the last step of the unroll of the trajectory Next slide. Uh, hint and output losses are minimized uh, against the ground truth to train the network to execute the algorithm. Next slide. Here I uh, show some details of the training protocol. Uh, we are training on problems of mixed sizes uh, of up to 16 nodes. And then we evaluate the train model on problems of size 64, because what we want to evaluate is the out of distribution performance. Uh, if the, have we learned the algorithm so that it generalizes to bigger sizes? Uh, so the results that Petar is going to present uh, always will refer to this generalization scores. And I'm going to let him now take over to give some additional motivation and present the results. Right. Thank you very much, Borja, for uh, the great overview of our work. And thank you so much for selecting our work for one of the oral presentations at LOG. It is a great pleasure. Uh, Borja told you a little bit about what our general data and training pipeline looks like. But we said at the beginning, we kind of want to train one model to execute all algorithms. And it might be a good moment to just pause and ponder, why do we even care about this? Like, why do we care about building one graph neural network that is somehow in its latent space capable of doing all these various things? things like sorting, searching, pathfinding, convex hull finding, and so on. Well, the way I like to think about it is it's really all about problem solving. Like, let's try to step back and think how, at least in the past, we as humans have been approaching problem solving, especially in areas adjacent to software engineering, and see if there are maybe some things that we could change or make more efficient or disrupt in the future. So you have a problem, for example, uh, I like to always give the context of, uh, of map uh, routing because it relates to some work we've done with Google Maps in the past. Uh, you have your problem, your real world problem, which gives you all the data about the state of the road network at a particular point in time. And from all that complicated data, you need to somehow tell some agents in traffic which way they need to move, right? And how would you approach this problem as uh, an up and coming computer scientist? Well, you would probably draw back to the years of uh, algorithmic training and knowledge you've amassed, uh, and maybe some textbooks you've read. And from there, you get some idea on what is an algorithm that might be aligned to the problem you want to solve. 
very likely in this case, this might be something like Dijkstra's algorithm. But to apply Dijkstra's algorithm, you cannot run it directly on the data. You need to have the data in this very cleaned up graph form where every edge has exactly one scalar weight and so on. So you basically need to manually or with the use of heuristics convert this complicated real world data into the format where the algorithm like Dijkstra's can even be applied in the first place. And then you can use your knowledge to implement Dijkstra's algorithm, get the shortest paths that you need. And then from those shortest paths, once again, it's usually uh, rarely straightforward to go directly from the shortest path to the output you serve to the user. So some additional uh, human intervention might be necessary to go from the algorithmic outputs to something that people can actually use. And we've basically identified several bottlenecks in the way this traditional approach to problem solving is because first of all, manually converting tons of raw data is the reason why we have deep learning in the first place. We know for a long time that humans are not good at doing this. So we hope to be able to automate away this part of the pipeline if possible. And also sometimes, you know, you might say you want to do Dijkstra's algorithm, but very often the algorithm you want to use is really not obvious. And it may not be clear if you need one algorithm or a combination thereof. Uh, in the context of road networks, if you route everyone using Dijkstra's algorithm, which is a greedy shortest path algorithm, uh, during peak rush hour, I guarantee you, you're going to clog the most important roads in the network and you're going to cause massive congestions for everyone. So in reality, you might want to send some agents in the network to not the shortest path, so to protect the main arteries of your road network from becoming congested. And therefore, immediately you need a few extra algorithms rather than just Dijkstra. And this procedure, basically is really this old school pipeline is not very well amenable to something like this. So with neural algorithmic reasoning, the rough blueprint of which Bohr had presented to you uh, earlier in this deck, we can hopefully try to break the blue bottleneck in the future because we can pre-train these high dimensional GNN models that sort of execute the algorithms in this high dimensional space and then basically reuse them as high dimensional differentiable components in a downstream pipeline from raw data. So that breaks the blue bottleneck. And now if we have a model that can execute many things at once, this might break our red bottleneck, which basically if we have a latent space that can execute some key basis of algorithms that we care about, then maybe our uh, encoders can then just learn to use some interesting soft combination of these algorithms by hooking them up to a pre-trained model like that. And how did we manage to do this? Uh, many previous results basically said that to get a good generalist learner, you basically have to learn uh, from algorithms that are tightly related. And what we actually found is that when we initially tried to learn all these algorithms, we got a lot of NANDs. And we basically realized that the key limitation that stopped us from doing this in the past is that if a task is really hard to learn, has very unstable gradients, those instabilities amplify when you learn 30 things at once and cause breakages for everybody else. So what we started out by doing is basically trying to fix the single task stability first. So we have a lot of uh, individual improvements to the data pipeline, the GNN model, the initialization training regime that we detail in our paper. Some of the most important ones were the ways in which we initialize the network the way we clip our gradients and doing reasoning over triplets rather than just doing pairwise message passing. And combining all these improvements, we improve on the previous best known out of distribution baseline on CLRS for single task learning by basically over 20% in absolute performance. And we also basically double the number of tasks that we're able to solve really well uh, above 90% out of distribution. So it's a pretty significant result combining all of these different uh, improvements and the previous uh, approaches were state of the art in algorithmic learning for many years ago. And last thing that we found really useful to scale this process up in the multitask regime, so to scale up from single task to multitask, is to add this simple chunking mechanism, which helped protect us against out of memory issues, but it also improved the learning stability a lot. And the idea is very simple. You take your trajectory of intermediate states, your hints, and you cut it up into smaller parts, maybe 16 steps at a time. And uh, if your trajectory doesn't fully fit into 16 steps, you just, it's okay. You just start from an intermediate point and you reinitialize your hidden state to zeros. This should be actually fine in principle because all of our algorithmic tasks are designed to be Markovian. If you predicted the right hints, it shouldn't matter what the hidden state is. So our method actually also provides a useful regularizer beyond just being good for learning stability. And you can see on average, there are some tasks that we do better in multi thread task regime. There are some tasks that we do worse, but on average, these two bars at the far right, our multitask model, which is a single GNN with a single set of parameters, matches the performance of specialist GNNs that were trained just to execute those individual tasks. So 
And further, besides just demonstrating this generalist result, we've uh, thoroughly ablated this. There's over thousands of experiments in these plots here, but basically through all these experiments, we've shown that every single one of those things we introduced into the model significantly helps the performance of the model. Here, the y-axis is the average performance across all the algorithms, and the lines are us gradually removing one at a time all those improvements that we introduced to our multitask model and seeing how the performance deteriorates as we remove them one at a time. And as a result, we've now produced our paper, which uh, we've made available on the archive some time ago. We like to think it's been a bit of a success and we would also like to see what we can do in the future. So watch this space. There's gonna be a lot of exciting applications of these models in the future. And you know, if you're interested in any of this and you'd like to know more, do please reach out to any of us during the poster sessions or otherwise. Uh, we like to make a bit of a joke. A few years ago, we were interviewed by VentureBeat and they pulled some words out of context to say DeepMind is developing one algorithm to rule them all. And well, we felt compelled to respond. And we feel like with this work, we've been able to at least partially respond. And also besides from this paper, there's a lot of fun algorithmic research we're presenting at LOG. There's some papers on algorithmically aligned GNNs, learning graph search heuristics and learnable commutative monoids for GNNs. Also various papers deploying these models in real world tasks like reasoning modulated representations and SNAP. And if this excited you and you wanna learn how to build these models yourself, tomorrow we're gonna to have a full on three hour tutorial on your algorithmic reasoning with myself, Andrea and Andrew, and there will be code examples. So we hope to see you there if this piqued your interest. And for, lastly, if you're in Cambridge tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we will have a log meetup from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. where we will have a very diverse program of very exciting talks, including some of the things that I just mentioned. So. Hope any of this is interesting to you. Hope you liked our work and uh, we hope to see you at the poster session, which starts in about two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the great presentation. We have a couple of questions uh, and I think that we have time for them. Uh, the first one coming from Matt, uh, very interesting on the neural algorithmical network. How did you determine what might be useful hints to provide for training? I presume they are used in a teaching forcing way. Mm -hmm. This is an excellent question. Thanks for asking uh, and thanks for listening. Um, I have basically like the CLRS benchmark was developed over a two and a half year period and hints were for the most part manually plucked out by me. This is the reason why it took so long to, to build this benchmark. Like I basically went through the algorithmic ex execution, found out what are all the key points where hints should be placed so that one step of a GNN could reasonably go from hint to time t to time t plus one without any memory needing, needing to be stored. And lastly, there was a lot of effort to paralyzing these hints as much as possible. So these classical algorithms, they're optimized to like, you know, touch one part of the graph at one point in time and you have like a for loop over all the nodes then. We tried to parallelize out those for loops as much as possible to align it better with what a GNN would do. So yeah. Basically, that was our rough design philosophy, but uh, for the most part, it was just manual decisions uh, taken by me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from Joshua. Uh, how do you generalize GNM processor for various graph related problem solving? Right. So that's actually an important point to note uh, in that uh, the processor is completely shared. Well, the triplets and other stuff proved quite helpful for various classes of problems. But what really specializes us to different problems are the different uh, input and output specs and the encoders and decoders. So the idea is what's different for each problem is how you take the specific inputs for graphs for sorting and whatever, and you encode them in this shared latent space that Borja told you about, and then decode answers out of them. But those things, because you could argue those are very moving parts, we made them all to be very simple. They're just linear encoders and decoders for the most part. So in reality, most of the representational pressure is placed on this unified processor, which somehow, we don't yet know how, has to figure out how to squeeze all these different ways of computation uh, in a shared latent space. Thank you so much. There are several other questions in the Q&A, so if you have time to have a look, we unfortunately ran out of time for the oral session, but thank you once again to all of you, amazing presentation, and I'm heading back to Hannes. All right, awesome. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Julia. Uh, this is this is so great and yeah Petter you already uh, mentioned the, the right thing the poster sessions are starting now and yeah let, let's over, head over but before that I very quickly want to to share my screen here uh, like uh, 
uh, we, we have this, the schedule here, right? And if you want to, to look at the schedule in more detail, for example, for the orals here, then yeah, here you can see all of the orals that are happening, like these three, for example. And then you can also press here in the bottom, the tutorial that Petra just mentioned, the tutorials, where will this tutorial be? Uh -huh. Here, 10th of December, we will have Petra, <clears throat> um, Andrea and Andrew talking about you know, like reasoning, a very long tutorial, which I'm sure will be a the same goes for the post sessions, which we will get now, right? And for the post sessions, uh, for example, if you go to our Slack, you can find the Gather Town link. You can find the Gather Town link at, in many other locations as well. But just press on the Gather Town link, and here in in this application, you can then give yourself a nice name. Uh, you can you can edit your your avatar. Press join, and here we are. You're in the. Um, I'm right now in the sponsor booth. Here you can run around, and you have these four rooms. You have the poster room one, poster room four, but these are not the rooms for for the poster session today. These are the rooms for the other poster session. Here is poster room one and poster room two. These are the two poster rooms for today. And yeah, you just just head in, uh, go to the people, and. Go to the poster, press X, and then you see the the ni this nice poster here, for example. So everyone, please head over, find the the link to Gather Town here in Slack pinned to the top, and then let's talk on, on Gather. Yeah, have the amazing discussions that I'm sure you all have. And with that, thank you so much for for being here today, for asking these great questions, and continue the discussions on Gather Town. See you tomorrow. Or in other town. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm going to end the, the webinar.